Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the regular Bellevue City Council meeting for May 3rd, 2021. Clerk, could you please do the roll call? Sure. Mayor Robinson? Here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse? Here. Council Member Barksdale? Here. Council Member Lee? Here. Council Member Robertson? I'm here. Council Member Stokes? And Council Member Stokes. Okay, we just had Council Member Stokes. I will work to get him back online here. And Council Member Zahn. Here. Thank you. Okay, I uh, was going to have Council Member Stokes read the flag salute or lead the flag salute, but I'll go ahead and do it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United yeah, States, States of America, America. America and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. We have three proclamations tonight. The first one is Older Americans Month proclamation, and this is a day. Um, this started in 1963 when then President John F. Kennedy designated May as a uh, time to celebrate those 60 and older. Yay. Uh, accepting this proclamation tonight, we have Mary Fredeen, who's chair of the Bellevue Network on Aging. And I was honored to serve on the Bellevue Network on Aging for almost seven and a half years. And so that is near and dear to my heart. I really appreciate the work that they do informing the city on so many important decisions that we have to make. I am going to go ahead and read this proclamation. The city of, whereas the city of Bellevue includes a growing number of older Americans who have built resilience and strength over their lives through successes and difficulties. And whereas 14% of Bellevue's population are age 65 or older, and whereas the city benefits when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds are included and encouraged to share their talents and experience. And whereas Bellevue recognizes our need to nurture and empower ourselves throughout our lifetimes while continuing to grow and thrive in times of both joy and difficulty. And whereas the city of Bellevue can foster communities of strength by creating opportunities to connect and learn from each other engaging older adults through education, recreation, and service, and encouraging people of all ages to celebrate connections and resilience. Now, therefore, I, Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2021 as Older Americans Month. I urge every resident to, re resident to recognize older adults and the people who support them as essential contributors to our community. Uh, and accepting that is Mary Fredine. And I know we have Dan Lassiter on, uh, on this call as well. And Dan, I've known you for goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking 14, 15 years. And every time I've been involved with you, you've always had a smile on your face. So the fact that you are the staff member with the Bellevue Network on, on aging, as well as many other things, it's just a great fit. So uh, yeah. Um, Chair Fredine, would you do you have something you'd like to say? I do. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. The Bellevue Network on Aging (BNOA) was formed in 2006 to act in an advisory capacity to the City of Bellevue Parks and Community Services Department. 51% of the BNOA members are over the age of 50, and members must live or work in Bellevue. The members volunteer their time and energy participating in one or more committees or projects. The mission of the BNOA is dedicated to healthy aging in our community by promoting awareness of needs, needs and resources that support older adults through life's transitions. The theme of the May 2021 Older Americans Month is Communities of Strength. As we pass the one year mark of the COVID-19 lockdown, we reflect on the successes and ongoing challenges we all face with our emphasis being on our older population. 
In an effort to help create communities of strength, we work at understanding what is going on in our diverse communities, and we want to be involved. The BNOA is the eyes and ears of local and regional issues that affect older adults. We are a source of information around these issues, and we present recommendations to the city for action. Bellevue has become a city with a very diverse population of both English and non-English speaking older citizens. Seniors are living independently as well as being included in extended family situations with their children and grandchildren. It's important that all of Bellevue's older citizens are aware of the many services available to them in the city. With the order from Governor Inslee to stay home, stay safe, one of the biggest challenges we faced in 2020 has been how to get important information out to older adults who do not have access to a computer or simply don't use them. A few of the issues BNOA has been working on all year are ways to keep folks informed about COVID-19, transportation options, meals on wheels, and food delivery for those not willing or not able to go out. Our members volunteer to serve on one or more of three main committees, outreach, transportation and housing, and advocacy. Here's what we've been working on in 2020. Continued focus on community outreach and vial of life distribution. In 2020 and 2021, BNOA members wrote and posted articles of interest to aging adults for neighborhood news. For example, extra help for seniors for paying for RX, Medicare Advantage open enrollment, reflections from a happy soul, solo senior, I knew I was gonna mess that up, uh, resource ideas, example, food bank, transportation, and internet connections. Work to expand the locations in the Bellevue community where resource information helping older adults could be distributed. BNOA team members stayed involved with Eastside Easy Rider Collaborative, City of Bellevue comprehensive plan update recommendations, and reflected older adult feedback to the Puget Sound Regional Council concerning the 2022 Regional Transportation Plan and Coordinated Plan Update advocated for Medicare observation status, the expansion of Medicare benefits to include dental, vision, and hearing, supported the need for adequate funding for senior services via the Older Americans Act, and advocated for Bellevue affordable housing. Our goals for 2021 on this uh, individual committees, outreach, a main goal of the BNOA in 2021 is to have bigger presence at farmers markets, libraries, YMCA, and other locations when seniors can once again gather together. Continue to focus on community outreach and vial of life distribution. Support proclamations that assist older Americans in our communities, including Older Americans Month and World Elder Abuse Awareness Day promote presentations to Eastside community groups and continue writing and posting neighborhood news articles of interest and importance to seniors and expand locations for distribution of the resource information. Housing and transportation. Seniors living on fixed incomes face continued challenges to aging in place. Downsizing requires a comparably priced place to move into, which is frequently not available. We need more affordable housing for aging adults on fixed incomes. The adult family home and assisted living facility isn't a sustainable model. The costs are out of reach for many older adults. Moving away from a forever home, a neighborhood, friends and family is frequently the only choice income constraints seniors have. As we age, many of us will give up driving Convenient and accessible transportation alternatives must be available so that seniors can continue to participate in our community and continue to conduct their daily living activities. We will continue to work to identify and promote awareness of transportation options. Continue to participate in conferences and projects and discussions that focus on housing and transportation needs. And advocacy will continue to advocate legislative priorities to introduce and support bills on Medicare observation status, work to secure adequate funding for the Older Americans Act, advocate for expansion of Medicare benefits 
dental, vision, and hearing, preserve Medicaid benefits, and restore Medicaid coverage for hearing aids in Washington, preserve Washington's long-term care infrastructure, and support legislation that creates affordable housing and fully funds housing trust fund. The BNOA will continue regional collaborations by working closely with Kirkland Senior Council, Aging and Disability Services Advisory Council, Washington State Senior Lobby, AARP, State Council on Aging, Eastside Easy Rider Collaborative, and King County Ombudsman. Our senior population is growing. We're living longer and we're an important part of the city's planning and growth process. Seniors are a valuable asset by virtue of their historical place in the community, their commitment to the city, and their willingness to participate in making the citywide changes necessary for all of us to successfully live side by side. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next proclamation is for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We have Council Member Lee reading that one. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, whereas more than 24 million Americans proudly identify themselves to be of Asian, Native Hawaiian, and or other Pacific Island heritage, and whereas Asians and Pacific Islanders form an American community of some 25 major ethnic groups who speak over 15 different languages and belong to a wide variety of religions and cultures. And whereas approximately 36% of Bellevue's population is comprised of Asians or Pacific Islanders, one of the highest percentages among Washington cities. And whereas the region's Asian American community has supported efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19 with donations of personal protective equipment and food for essential workers. And whereas Japanese immigrants played a key role in Bellevue's historical place as an agriculture center and Asian and Pacific Islander Americans continue to enrich our region's culture through excellence in technology, the arts and design. And whereas Asian and Pacific Islander American entrepreneurs strengthen our economy and our communities through their dedication and ingenuity, inspiring the next generation of American innovation by example. And whereas May of 2021 marks the 43rd anniversary of the annual celebration that has become Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And therefore, I, on behalf of Mayor Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of all its City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2021 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in Bellevue, and encourage residents to celebrate the many contributions of Asians and Pacific Islanders to our community, reflect on the cha challenges they have faced in our past, support them against hate now. Lynn Robinson, Mayor, City of Bellevue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Con uh, Council Member Lee. And then the last one is a Public Service Recognition, recognition Week Proclamation. Council Member Zahn, would you like to read that one? Yes, thank you, Mayor, I'd be happy to. Uh, whereas Americans are assisted every day by public servants at the federal, state, county, and city levels, and whereas normally doing their jobs behind the scenes, these employees thrive to perform their tasks with efficiency, excellence, and integrity. And whereas public servants at all levels of government have been essential in responding to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing recovery. And whereas Bellevue's public servants are recognized as an invaluable resource helping countless residents thrive on a daily basis across our increasingly diverse community. And whereas many public servants, including military personnel, police officers, firefighters, healthcare professionals, risk their lives daily during their jobs. And whereas public service is a noble calling involving a variety of challenging 
and rewarding professions from teachers to road crews, firefighters and police to public health doctors. Mm -hmm. And whereas we benefit daily from the knowledge and skills of the highly trained individuals who work in our government. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, mayor of the city of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its city council, do hereby proclaim the week of May 2nd to the 8th, 2021, as Public Service Recognition Week in Bellevue and urge all citizens to reflect on the contributions of public employees who carry on out the missions of our various branches of government. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any <clears throat> opposed? Okay, uh, city clerk, do we have any oral communications? <clears throat> People signed up for that? Thank you, Mayor. This evening, there are two pre-registered speakers for oral communications. And with that, I will call our first speaker who is Sharon Lai. And Ms. Lai, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, your time begins now. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Robinson and council members. I'm Sharon Lai, Senior Director of Development with the Cloud View Project, speaking in support of your study uh, session item 10B. Um, the Cloud View team is proud to be collaborating with East Hub and planning this multi-performance playhouse facility as part of the project's proposed vibrant office, residential, hotel, and retail mixed-use project. Uh, the East Hub Place, Playhouse will be a major cultural destination in the east side and will activate downtown Bellevue in particular during the evening. We are thrilled to be working to make this significant community forward investment, which is estimated around $44 million, uh, by constructing a pad ready space for the development, as well as garage parking for the Playhouse, which will be a tremendous boon to the arts development in the city as well as to the community as a whole. We look forward to its completion and uh, we are in full support of East Hub's presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lai. And the next speaker on our list is Heidi Dean. And Ms. Dean, can you hear me? I can, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, your time begins now. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Robinson and council members. I'm speaking tonight for myself, but also on behalf of Mr. Kelly O'Neill, who I talked to on Friday. And due to health issues, he was unable to email or call in himself, but he did give me his blessing to make this ask. And it's a promise that he asked me to keep when I became the community club president in 2013. Tonight, you're being asked to approve the park board's name recommendation for Newport Hills soon to be developed park property. I've written to you before, and I've spoke during oral communications about why the recommendation is the wrong choice, and I emailed you again today. I understand it may feel uncomfortable for the council to vote against the park board's recommendation, but voting no isn't an invalidation of their previous work. I've seen council vote no on planning commission recommendations, so it's not unheard of to do so. Per the information regarding park naming protocol that's in your agenda memo, the recommended park name doesn't check any of the boxes. Mrs. Ringdahl's contributions were to the school district, hence Ringdahl Middle School. She lived in the Highland Northup area of Bellevue, which more closely identified with Kirkland. And the info presented tonight as a background check is the same stuff that I pulled up with a Google search. On the other hand, Shannon's Glen Neighborhood Park would honor the original owner of the park property and keep with the wishes of the family members who made it available to the city for the purchase. Cal O'Neill could have made more money selling that property to a housing developer, but he did what he thought his dad would want, which was give the neighborhood that he loved a peaceful place to gather and play. Shannon O'Neill was a legend in this neighborhood. There are many people still living here who knew him as a friend or worked for him who'd be willing to speak to his character. And that is a much more comprehensive background check than what was done for Mrs. Ringdahl. So my ask is this, please vote no on the park board's recommendation and vote yes to Shannon's Glen Neighborhood Park. After waiting 11 years for a park and all the turmoil that has accompanied the planning process, 
keeping the connection to Newport Hills history is the right thing to do. And I thank you for your consideration of that. And oh, I have 39 seconds left. And I also wanted to um, say, I see that you're going to be getting an update from Parks um, talking about different acquisitions. And I would really like to encourage you to move forward on the uh, off-leash study, the recommendations in the off-leash study and look for additional properties around the city um, to build off-leash locations. Uh, it's going to get very crowded at the Newport Hills Park once it's developed. That off-leash area has attracted way too many people from outside the neighborhood and we desperately need it around the city. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Dean. And that is the end of our pre-registry uh, registered list of speakers. If there is anyone else connected to this call who would like to provide oral communication to the council, please use the raise hand function or star nine if you're connected with a phone. And Mayor, I do not see any additional hands that will close the oral communications. Okay, thank you. So the next, uh, we are on to reports to the community council boards and commissions, and we have a presentation by the Parks Board. Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce this? Good evening, uh, Mayor and council members. Um, there is a report um, in your pack today uh, on behalf of the Park Board. It is a report and writing, and there is no presentation on the part of the Park Board this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then we're on to the consent calendar. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have three study session items. Uh, the first one being the Newport Hills neighborhood part name selection. So Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce that? Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, tonight, uh, as you mentioned, staff will present an update to the Council on the process of naming the new park located in the Newport Hills neighborhood. Uh, as par uh, part of tonight's presentation, the park board, will also, park board will also present a recommendation on the park name to Council. Um, once the presentation is completed, staff will seek Council's direction on how they'd like to proceed in adopting a preferred name of the park. Um, joining us this evening are uh, Michael Shiasaki, who's the director of the Parks and Community Services Department, along with Pam Furman, Planning and Development Manager. And joining us this evening also is Heather Troskis, the Chair of the Park and Community Services Board. With that, uh, I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Michael to begin the presentation. Michael? Great, thank you very much, City Manager Miyake. And I will ask Pam Fairman to pull up the PowerPoint, please. All right, let's just see if I can make this happen. <laughs> okay, here goes, we're gonna go, go there. Share. Is it showing? Yes, it is. Thank you, okay. Pam. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and City Council members. I'm Michael Shiyasaki, and why don't we go to the next slide, please, Pam? We are here this evening seeking City Council direction for a park name for the soon to be built park in the Newport Hills neighborhood. Next slide, please. So tonight, here's kind of, uh, here's the game plan. So tonight, Pam Fairman will uh, share a brief review of the Newport Hills Park naming, planning and uh, naming processes. Uh, uh, she will cover the city's park naming policy and then also share the community name preferences. And then Heather Treskus, the chair of the park board, will share the board's considerations and their recommended name for the park. So with that, I will hand this off to Pam Fairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'd like to orient you here, first of all, to the park, which is located in Southwest Bellevue in the Nor Newport Hills neighborhood, indicated by the blue dashed line on the slide. Uh, the new 13.7 acre park at 11550 Southeast 60th Street is highlighted in yellow on the slide before you. In December of 2018, the City Council approved the 2019-25 CIP 
projected budget that included $3 million to plan, design, and construct a new neighborhood park in Newport Hills. The park planning process began in May 2019 and included three community meetings, two park board and community meetings, and a council meeting. Public meetings were well attended and staff received great feedback throughout the planning process. The park planning concluded with a parks and community service board recommendation and council support of the preferred park plan in December 2019. Before you on the slide is the preferred park. This park with forested trails will have about three acres of developed park area that will include an open lawn area, playground, loop trails, picnic shelter, restroom, and an off-leash dog area. Of note to our naming discussions tonight and highlighted on the preferred plan are the adjacent Ringdahl Middle School and Lakehurst Creek that runs partially through the park. The council adopted park naming policy um, was included in the council packet. Uh, the policy sets forth, po um, sets forth uh, procedures for naming public parks and recreation facilities and underlines the council's intent that naming of city parks be approached with deliberation. Council typically selects a park name after receiving recommendation from the park board, which is based upon public input um, using the criteria as listed on the slide, a neighborhood or geographical identification, uh, historical figure or name of historical or cultural significance, an individual or group that has made a significant contribution to the park system. During the planning process, uh, we asked the community to suggest names for the new park. Staff additionally reached out to local historical groups to help research and inform name options. Park options consistent with park naming policies resulted in 22 potential park names. To help narrow options and understand the community's preferences, an online survey was conducted last fall of 2020. A request to participate in the survey was sent to those who had signed up to be notified on the City of Bellevue website, which means that over 1,200 community members received an email regarding the update and a request to participate. Staff also invited survey participants um, via the Newport Hills Community Club and Nextdoor websites and posted a sign in the park. The survey and city websites welcomed participation and let survey participants know that the survey was not a vote for a park name. However, shared that the park board and city council would uh, like to understand the community's preferences when they undertook park name deliberations. The city's park naming policy was also posted. Survey respondents were asked to provide their top three name preferences and for their contact information. We received 203 survey responses, of which 97 respondent, uh, respondents gave all or some personal information, including name, address, zip, code, or email. On the slide and also in your council packet are survey results showing the 22 suggested names in order of community preference. Newport Hills Neighborhood Park and Ringdahl Park were the most preferred names at the top of the list. Neighborhood historical figures provided popular name options. The middle school adjacent to the park Ringdahl was named after Mrs. Ringdahl who started the first hot lunch program at a Bellevue grade school in 1936 and retired from the Bellevue school district in 1968. Lee Edward Chip Hanauer grew up in the Newport Hills neighborhood is the third most successful unlimited hydroplane racer in history and has won the APBA Gold Cup, a record of 11 times. 
Um, you may remember his very famous um, uh, hydroplane boat, the Miss Budweiser. The name Shannon Glens Park was inspired by a previous 1965 owner of the property and prominent Newport Hills family and local real estate professional. Park names such as Tramway, Incline, and Bensonville were inspired by the Coal Creek, Newcastle, and Newport Hills area's rich mining history. Back in 1869, today's wooded hillsides were once dotted with tall smokestacks and lines of mine cars. During the height of its mining activity, the area had a larger population than Seattle. A railroad um, from Seattle ended at a station just below where Coal Creek Parkway intersects with Coal Creek and near this point were extensive bunkers and a coal coal washing plant. The coal, the coal trams red dash line shown on the slide imposed on a 1936 aerial before you transported the coal from the railway to what was Pleasant Point to be barged on Lake Washington towards Seattle. Local geographical and environmental identifiers also informed popular name suggestions. Although Newport Hills neighborhood was the most preferred name, Newport Hills Sunset, Woods, Hilltop, Happy Trails, Hawks Haven, and Laurelhurst Creek Park were also popular. On the slide before you is an overview of the Newport Hills neighborhood. The blue dash line again indicating the neighborhood area. The new park is highlighted in yellow with a dashed green line. Schools are indicated by light purple. Of note, the park adjacent Ringdahl Middle School. And existing parks and open space within the neighborhood area are Newport Hills Park, Newport Mini Park, and Coal Creek Open Space and Natural Area. Further evaluation of surveyed names, um, name preferences show support for all suggested names as shown on the pie chart. Uh, the six most preferred names are listed on the slide before you. Again, Newport Hills Neighborhood Park at the top, Ringdahl, followed by Ringdahl Park, Newport Hills Sunset Park, Newport Woods Park, Newport Hilltop Park, and Happy Trails Park. And at this point in time, I'd like to introduce you to Heather Treskes, Chair of the Parks and Community Services, to share insight into what the Park Board's name recommendation. Thank you, Pam. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson and uh, members of Council. I, uh, I'm here to officially recommend um, the Parks Community Services Board passed a motion to officially recommend the name Borghild Ringdahl Neighborhood Park for uh, the new park that's being developed in Newport Hills. I will say that we had uh, a very um, thoughtful, engaged, robust discussion. Um, and uh, when we came to our, our conclusion, our agreement on, on the name being recommended, uh, several things uh, led to that. I would say uh, Borghild Ringdahl's significance as a female historical figure and the contributions that she made to Bellevue as a whole, um, of course, in particular related to the hot lunch program in the school district, which you heard about with schools being the heart of a community. Um, it's certainly a, a contribution to, to Bellevue as a whole and, and not just specific to a school district. Uh, we also discussed the park's location adjacent to Ringdahl Middle School and that school being um, named Ringdahl and there since the 1970s. So going on 40, 40 years now, uh, that area of Bellevue having uh, a strong association with the name Ringdahl. We talked about the fact that um, Ringdahl was the neighborhood's second name preference. You saw um, the, the, I don't wanna say the, um, the rankings, but sort of how um, the community 
rated their uh, preferences and, and Ringdahl was certainly at the top of the list, close to the top of the list. We also felt that the, um, although often parks within neighborhoods have a name specifically tied to the neighborhood, um, there are, as you saw already, two other Newport Hills related park, uh, named parks. And so we felt that um, it was something we didn't want to duplicate, or in this case, it would be triplicate uh, by having another Newport Hills something park. And we felt, as I mentioned, that uh, Ringdahl has become associated, a name associated with that area of the neighborhood. And so these are, those were the, the top, the primary uh, reasons for how we came to the, the conclusion. As I said, uh, every parks board member was extremely engaged in the conversation and the discussion. And I was impressed at how thoughtful uh, of a process it was. So thank you. And um, I'll leave it at that. So uh, we are here seeking council direction to return with the resolution adopting the council's preferred park name, or um, if you would provide alternative direction to staff. All right, thank you very much. So council members on, you're the liaison, the council liaison to the uh, parks board. I'm gonna let you start uh, the discussion tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would say that uh, Trevor, Chair Treskis did a good job of summarizing what happened at the Parks Board meeting. It was a lengthy discussion and deliberation talking about the different names and what would be a significant name for this particular area. And we also talked at length about adding the, the top one from the survey, which was Newport Hills Neighborhood Park and whether having that name with the neighborhood was enough of a differentiator. As the chair said, there were already two other names that were called Newport Hills. So at the end, I, there was consensus amongst the Parks Board members that having Newport Hills within the name would be confusing. So if we, you said, oh, meet me up at Newport Hills Park, is it the neighborhood park, the park or the mini park? So I do think that that discussion led to the top choice from the survey being removed. And then the significant part of the time then was talking about uh, Ringdahl Park and whether there was any um, negative associations with the name. So doing some research to ensure that we um, were naming a park for a person that um, did not have some uh, negative history that might be associated with that. So I know that staff did that work. And then we uh, voted on the name. Uh, I guess one thing we did not mention is that it was a six to one vote. So it was nearly a unanimous, but not quite. And I would say that there was also discussions about the survey, the outreach of the survey, and who filled out the survey. So we did have some discussion about uh, what proportion of the survey was from the neighborhood or potentially the broader area. And staff mentioned that um, not all of the surveys, people filled in their names or their addresses. So there, it would be a proportion of those votes that uh, we don't have any information to um, identify one way or the other, whether they were Bellevue residents or not. Okay, thank you. So um, we're gonna go with council member Robertson, Stokes, Lee, Barksdale, Deputy Mayor Newhouse, and then myself. So council member Robertson, you thank used you. to be a uh, liaison to the parks board as well. Yes, uh, yes, it was a pleasure to work with them. Um, and thank you, um, Chair Treskis uh, for coming in creating the presentation or providing the presentation to council. So um, I always like to listen to our parks uh, or our boards and commissions. I am not super fond, however, of naming a park after a person, particularly, um, well, the Bovie Park uh, rename just brings to mind why I think 
it is not a good idea to name things after a person. So um, I'm not really in favor of naming it Ringdall Park. I would be in favor of, um, you know, Newport Woods, Newport Meadows. I mean, Shannon's Glen is a first name. I'm not, but that's named after a person as well. Um, so, but if the council feels strongly naming it Ringdall, I think it can be confusing because it's next to a school and that school used to be Eastside Catholic and then was named Ringdall. Um, and I think that school is going to be closed eventually um, when uh, Bellevue School District finishes their, their um, updating all the schools. So I think it could be confusing as to who owns it. I I'm just not really in favor of that. And it's totally within the council's wheelhouse to name. It's, it's, our, it's our prerogative to name things whatever we want. Um, so I'd like to hear from my colleagues, I guess, but I'm not very much in favor of naming it Ringdall. Thanks. Okay, Council Member Stokes, another former liaison to the Parks Commission. Parks, Parks Board member. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, I, I have uh, similar feelings about this. I think um, maybe it's difficult and uh, it just seems like that was an easy decision and you heard more the name was there, but I, I think it can be very confusing um, to have a school and is this the park for the school? And, uh, and I also agree uh, that um, perhaps naming it after a person is not, um, not the best way to go overall. I'm not just talking about this one. Um, so, and naming it another Newport is something else. It, it, it didn't seem like there was a lot of um, more imaginative thinking in terms of a, of this park um, in the conversation. Um, and this is a big decision and it'll be a you know final decision that will um, have effects. I would prefer to um, re-look at this and see if we can't come up with something that has a little more, some pizzazz to it, something that makes it uh, really more uh, identifiable in the neighborhood. Um, and I, I, and I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, Shannon's Glenn and the, the, the uh, emphasis behind that, but it also sets a, a, to a certain extent a precedent that may be followed in other places and makes it more difficult to have an overall uh, open look at um, how we name parks. So um, I'm, um, I'm not in favor of moving tonight on uh, Ringdahl Park. Thank you. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to ask a question first and then I'll talk. Uh, one long vote. What's the reason for the long vote against it? Would and you like me to request this? Go ahead. E either one. Whatever. Um, yes, I think, to be honest, I think it was uh, a lot of what has been referenced um, today. Uh, already by Council Member Robertson and Council Member Stokes. Um, as I said, there was a lot of uh, discussion and, and pros and cons on all the, the different names considered. And so I believe um, the primary, I can't speak specifically um, for that individual Parks Board member, but some of the reasons that were given had to do with the fact that the school, um, there was already a school named after Mrs. Ringdahl. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is a tough uh, choice, you know. It's like naming uh, your child's uh, <laughs> name. Yeah, it's a parent thing. You know, it's very subjective, I guess, uh, for whatever reason you just mentioned. So it's really looking for a compromise of some sort that fits uh, the description of what we want to do. When it's, you know, identifying the characteristic, the location of the place and whatnot. And in general, yeah, probably it's true. Uh, people, it's challenging, difficult because there's no historical contact, context. Uh, but it's in Newport Hills, so naturally that would be a good name, but there's already a few. But it could be readily, just like anything else, it could be identifiable. You know, we have lots of duplications. So in Newport Hills, and so I think it really depends on the people, the residents, you know, it's again, parents, you are the parents. You know, we can make choices, decisions, but, you know, it's going to live with you and you are living there. You know what it means to you, you know, the characteristics. And we so far, we haven't identified that much of it, you know, so we have to depend on what you've gone through. 
And so it's, to me, it's not fair for me to say, oh, this is the best one. But uh, my subjective <laughs> uh, comment, you know, uh, I would think Newport, Newport Hills has an identi identity. Everybody agreed, Newport Hills. And uh, it may be confusing, but I think we can, you know, do something to make it less confusing. So in that sense, there's been a lot of support, you know, and Newport Hills had 18%, okay? So it's a big chunk of people supporting it. Uh, and then Ringdoll, you know, for reasons that's been articulated, and I think the commission kind of talked about it. And uh, even though, yes, maybe we don't want to make a practice, but it does have um, some historical contest and it, it meets the, 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 you know, the, 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 I wouldn't say rule, but at least uh, the thought, thoughts of uh, identification, somebody that can recognize. So I think if we go, so it's a compromise of some sort. So my suggestion is Newport Hills Ring Door Park. That might be, you have a total of 18% plus 10%. That's 28%. To me, I think that's very respectable <laughs> for a consensus among the neighborhood people. So uh, if you can live with it, you know, that's it. If you cannot, I think it's up to the people who live in Newport Hills. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Councilmember Barksdale. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thanks to the park board. Thanks to your trust us. Um, so I think, I think there's enough diversity of people who could, who have made contributions in our community to maybe think of other names and not reuse names. I, I totally understand the proximity to Ringdahl High, Ringdahl Middle School, but just, I think we can probably broaden it out. And if we're gonna go with the with names, I would love for us to also think about people of color. Um, and so in terms of Newport Hills being in the title, um, I think that helps actually with location, right? Because it says where the park is, and then we just need to figure out what the qualifier is to distinguish this park from other parks in Newport Hills. That being said, I would be interested in, if we do um, say, you know, asked to have to come back, I would be interested in maybe whether we should uh, consider the names more holistically across the three parks to make sure that the names are distinct enough across the three. And then um, if we name it, if we don't name it after a person today, I mean, having a, a, a more general name like Newport Hills Neighborhood Park or whatever does allow us the ability to name it after someone later as well. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I too like to thank uh, Chair Treskus and uh, the entire board of the Parks and uh, Community Services Board. Always do a fantastic job and appreciate the staff work on, done on this as well. Um, yeah, I have some of the, uh, the, the some of the same reservations. That's what's been echoed here um, as, 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 as well. Um, not always a super big fan of naming after uh, parks or, or anything after or after people. Sometimes that can be problematic or at the time you don't think it might be, but then later on it can be. Um, and then also it's, it's, we run into this all the time where um, we're not exactly sure who was participating and it's kind of an ongoing issue. We, 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 you know, some people registered and we know they're Bellevue residents, but others did not. There's not an easy solution for that, unfortunately. But, um, um, but on the other hand, I believe we had, was it over 200 votes uh, in, 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 in total and we pushed out to 1200 people? Is that, is that correct? Do I have those numbers correct? That, that is correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, still still good, uh, certainly, a, uh, you know, a decent sized response. And, um, um, you know, I, I agree with the comment about the, the, the duplicate. Um, I also think it wouldn't make a lot of sense to, um, uh, to have uh, Newport Hills Neighborhood Park as there's too many uh, park names that start with that. However, and maybe this goes into what Councilmember Stokes is saying, maybe getting a little bit more creative in terms of like, you know, the Glen at Newport Hills or the Meadows at Newport Hills or putting something in front of that Newport Hills to kind of differentiate it from the, from the other parks that are called Newport Hills. But, um, uh, but uh, I would have to agree that I would like to see this go back to the, to the parks board. Um, I think there's some, some more work potentially here to come up with uh, uh, a name that's both distinctive. It's not going to cause any confusion. Uh, again, being the middle school, being um, named Ringdahl as well, also leads me to that uh, conclusion. I'd like to see it go back uh, and, and come back before the council. So thank you. 
Thank you. So having been on the parks board, I really appreciate the, uh, the park board members work on this. Uh, and I remember naming a park and having it go to council and having it change. I, my ego took a little hit that night. So um, I'm sorry that we're, we're talking about doing that. However, the thing that's interesting to me is, um, you know, there are certain criteria for naming a park. And one of them is that people will be able to know where it is given the name. And so uh, the obvious name starts with Newport Hills but we can't do that because we already have two parks that start with that. So then we go to what's another uh, uh, place finder name and Ringdahl Middle School being right next to the park, I guess is kind of an obvious choice. Although it could have been, is it, what is that milkshake shop that's been there forever? <laughs> we could have named it that. But um, I, you know, there's a difference between a neighborhood park and a regional park. Regional parks, they don't have a name that has that much heart with the neighborhood because you're trying to name it for the region. But this is a neighborhood park. And I really think that it needs to be something that resonates with the neighbors. And um, I, I like the idea of it being a Glen. I mean, that is what it is. It's just beautiful. Why don't, I would recommend we call it Newport Glen Neighborhood Park because nobody calls anything just Newport. It's either Newport Hills or you know not, but Newport Glen distinguishes it from the other Newport Hills parks, although it lets you know where it is. And it's a neighborhood park. It should be called a neighborhood park. So I think that that might be something that fits the criteria of naming a park. Um, but that's just my recommendation. So I'm gonna let Janice start, we'll go around again. And I think the decision is either, you know, we've had some uh, Newport Hills Ringdahl Park, um, the Meadows at Newport Hills, Newport Glen Neighborhood Park. Those are some um, possibilities that have been thrown out tonight, or we just pack it back up and send it back to the Parks Board and say, could we try this again? So let's go, let's go around the table again and see where you wanna go. Um, Council Member Zahn, why don't you start off? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And I really appreciate my colleagues giving feedback. I'm wondering, Pam, if you can put up the slide on the park name survey results, um, because I will say that I think it's really helpful for the Parks Board to get some feedback from the Council. And certainly if in the end, you know, that the council, we want to look at changing the criteria for park naming. So, you know, I think that it's very helpful if we believe that we don't want to be using historical figure names take, to take that out of the criteria so we don't have uh, both the community members as well as the parks board um, thinking that that's where we want to go. So um, I'm wondering if you can pull up the slide that shows the results of the different names because I do think that from the standpoint of, I just wanna point out to my colleagues that um, if you go back a couple of more slides there, there was one that had the survey results of all of the names right there. You'll see that there are, are a couple of choices that have the word Newport in there. Um, so we have Newport Woods Park, Newport Hilltop Park. And then when we talked about some creative names, um, I might point out that one of the names that was recommended was Lakehurst Creek Park, because this park is actually right next to that creek. And we did in the parks board also have some conversation about some, um, some other names like the um, Chun Tian Park, which is uh, Chinese for spring. So because we do have a, in a larger Asian population up in Newport Hills. So I think that was one of the names that there was some discussion about. There was also the one, um, the, the Ying Chun Hua Park for uh, winter jasmine. So I just put that out there because I think that there was some creativity when we did the outreach for survey names. So perhaps I, I would recommend that for the council, if there are certain names that you would not want the parks board to consider, um, I, I would recommend that we give that direction to them so that they can more narrowly um, consider these names. 
or if you find that these are not names that you would be able to support, then we can certainly go again. Uh, but these were names that came from the survey of the community. And then the second part I would ask staff is this, perhaps one way, since this is a neighborhood park, is perhaps similar to the NEP, that this is one where we're doing the outreach to the community that lives in the neighborhood to vote for the park because we certainly have a process, we've done that to ensure that those in the neighborhood are voting for the names. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Council Member Zahn. Council Member Robertson. It sounds to me that although we haven't coalesced around a single name, the council seems to be supportive of having something with the name Newport in it, but not repetitive Newport Hills something and not having it named for a person. So my preference, um, just for the ease of, Parks Board is updating the Parks Master Plan and Finance Plan this year, would be just for the council to um, just pick a name. Um, whether we do it tonight or we think about it and bring it back. But I would support the Glen at Newport Hills. I would support, what was the one, Mayor, you said it was uh, Newport Glen Neighborhood Park. I think something like that is lovely, but it's people can find it. It has the word Newport in it. Um, or even the Meadows at, uh, I think Jared said, or Deputy Mayor said the Meadows at Newport Hills, that would be fine too. Something like that, I think would be wonderful. It captures this beautiful open space that's wooded and meadows, uh, and it still has the word Newport in it. So um, that's my recommendation rather than sending it back to the Parks Board to grapple with. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Stokes. I can't hear you. There you go. Okay. I know. I get the okay. thing. Um, you yeah, I think it needs to have Newport in it. Uh, I like Newport Glen. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just contemplating whether you should go ahead and try to make a decision tonight or, you know, take a week and think about it. Um, and I do agree that if we uh, what we expressed, I think, uh, clear, uh, most of us at least have said that we really don't want to name it after individuals. So we should change that criteria uh, and not have it, not even put that out there because that, that confuses things. So uh, that's, you know, things change and that's the lesson learned. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to think I, 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 if the, the Chinese names, it's, it's, um, if there's some way to have a, a, a little more um, identification, but um, I mean, I, I don't know that the pronunciation, I don't know how that would go, or I think they would like to think about that. Maybe there's another uh, way we could look at it. And I'd like to look at the, uh, you know, a little more at the uh, makeup of the community and whether that would be, you know, we can look, talk about that. Um, I mean, this is a, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but this is something, once we name it, it's going to be named that for a long time. So we have to be careful and deliberate. Um, but I, if, if their desire is to name it tonight, I would, I think uh, Newport Glen has a, um, a really good sound to it. And I think people will associate with Newport Hills. That's, um, or you could call it Newport Hills Glen, but I think having the Glen in, and then people say they're going to the Glen or they're going to the park or they're going to the other piece. So um, I think we're, I think we can come to resolution on that. I would be willing to do it tonight uh, or, uh, you know, bring it back. Okay, thank you. Council Member Lee. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, you need to have identification. Newport Hills is the identification. Yeah, however fun you want to do it, you know, it doesn't matter. And then if you want to create, be creative, put something else into it, I think that's fine. Uh, you know, because we, we talked about it, you know, it's the people who have voted. And somebody suggested maybe like NEP, you know, to get people to take a vote, which in a way they already did, you know, 18%, 10%, but they're voting for a whole bunch of things. So maybe you can narrow it down. You might have a better way, better idea of getting it you know, to what people really want. But whether that's the satisfactory way or not, we haven't really talked about it. And maybe it isn't. In that case, the council will make one. Uh, so I, I'm pretty easy, comfortable, you know, uh, number one, identifying Newport Hills. 
or if you don't want to use the word hills or something to Newport, maybe that's enough of identification. But you know, if you really want to do the job, Newport Hills, something. Okay, whatever you want to describe, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if it's a park, it's a park. It's a glen, it's a glen. The name is a name. You know, what it is, it is. You cannot change that. So that's my way I stand. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Barksdale. Uh, thanks, Mayor. So um, I could I could get with Newport Glen. The reason I mentioned Newport Hills is um, similar to what uh, Councilmember Lee said. At least you know from a information architecture or like taxonomy perspective that you're in the right vicinity if you have Newport Hills, even if it does repeat. Um, but I'm fine with Newport Glen Neighborhood Park. Maybe it's even shorter, Newport Neighborhood Park, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'm fine with a lot of the um, different options that we're talking about right now, in particular uh, as it relates to the Glen. So uh, the Glen at Newport Hills or um, Newport Glen or Newport Hills Glen. Um, I like the direction of that, but I'm also not opposed to having this go back to the uh, Parks Board as well. Um, if they wanted uh, um, to, um, again, review some different names and come back to the uh, council again. Thank you. Okay, so as much as I would love to name this tonight, I, I, I like Councilmember Zahn's recommendation that we take it back to the Parks Board, that we ask that it be a local process, um, that it be a Bellevue resident process. And it is a neighborhood park. And I think the neighbors in Newport Hills pretty much know where this is. So it just has to be something, in my opinion, that they're going to recognize and love and embrace. And um, so we have support for adding the word Glen in there somehow. So maybe we could ask if the Parks Board could consider um, instead of Shannon's Glen, that it be something else Glen and also, you know, make that like number 23 recommendation and look at these other recommendations again, or however you think, uh, Mr. Shiosaki, it's really, up to you how you wanna present it back to the parks board, but there seems to be a consensus to go back out for uh, more of a local opinion on this. And um, we're okay with Newport, maybe not Newport Hills, and like to incorporate the word Glen somewhere and um, see what else. And I think there's a consensus for not naming it after a person. Right, I, I, th I think that's pretty specific direction. So we will take that back to the park board for consideration and return. So thank you. Great, thank you, Heather, appreciate. We uh, look forward to hearing back from you. What's your timeline, Michael, do you think? Well, um, why don't I get that figured out before I just answer that off the top <laughs> of my head? I think, you know, I think it can be a pretty rapid process, I'll hope, but, um, let me let me do a little bit of digging before I uh, before I respond. So thank you. Okay, great, good conversation. Thank you. All right, the next study session item is East Hub. Mr. Miyaki, would you like to introduce that? Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> this evening, the Council will be provided an informational background briefing on the East Hub organization. Um, this briefing will include an overview of East Hub organizational model, their vision and goals, as well as their collaboration with the city. So um, joining us this evening are Jesse Canedo, our Chief Economic Development Officer, as well as Scott McDonald, Arts Program Manager from uh, Community Development, both from Community Development Department, um, to begin the presentation, as well as to introduce our guest and begin the presentation. So Jesse? Thank you, City Manager Miyaki. I'm actually going to hand it right over to Scott. Sorry, I had a video uh, issue. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and uh, Council for having us here tonight. Um, tonight, the bulk of the conversation is going to be uh, conducted by East Hub. Um, but uh, Jesse and I wanted to provide just a little context um, for how this East Hub work fits within some broader initiatives. So tonight we're gonna, uh, East Hub will be giving the bulk of the presentation, as I mentioned, um, 
The uh, staff considers them a community development partner um, and no direction is requested at this time. And as I mentioned, the, we, we see East Hub as fitting in with within the city's broader initiatives to, to create better partnerships out in the community. Um, we recognize that ex external partners is, is really the way that we can do much better work out in the community. We can, we are, we are limited by what we can do and without our partners, um, we can't realize the full vision for definitely the arts and cultural community. Um, within this, this broader landscape of partnerships, um, we see we have work that's ongoing with many organizations, both um, long established in the community, uh, like Kids Quest, the Bellevue Arts Museum, new collaboratives like the Eastside Culture Coalition um, and East Hub, as well as connections that we are making with uh, corporate entities as well. Um, and so it, it's just important context uh, for their presentation to understand that this work really aligns with a lot of the components of the economic development plan and initiatives that we have here at the city in arts and culture. Um, I will point out before we get into it, we, the <laughs> staff are working with East Hub on a couple items um, for a partnership. One is a arts community calendar that the uh, Arts, organization, arts and cultural organizations have long asked for, but staff has not been able to um, build or maintain. So that's a great example of how uh, these types of partnerships can actually um, create these long needed things. Um, and then we're also talking with East Hub about ways to expand uh, bellwether and also awareness of bellwether as um, a signature destination event. So with that, I will turn it over to East Hub for their presentation. Thanks, Scott. Good, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Cullum. I'm the CEO of East Hub. Uh, you see there our, our, our motto, our tagline, culture creates community. That's really as, as close as we can come to summing up our perspective and our, uh, our mission for what it is that we're doing and why we do it. Um, because I'm an old uh, theater producer, I like to do things with big casts. So we have a few uh, presenters tonight who are going to help me out. Next slide, please, Scott. Uh, so uh, me, Ray Colm, the CEO of East Hub, Sudeshna Dixit, who is our Director of Cultural Connections, will be taking a piece. Uh, Michael Bobbitt, who is our uh, Racial and Equity uh, our EDI consultant. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce our board chair, uh, Elka Suber, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the foundation of East Hub and uh, a little bit about our mission in the community. And if we could have the next slide, please, Scott. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. I'd like to first thank Mayor Robinson, the Deputy Mayor, City Manager Miyaki, members of the Bellevue City Council, the City staff, and the Bellevue Arts Commission. Um, as you know, East Hub is a new 501c3 community development nonprofit that was just established um, this past year in 2020. The opportunity that we see for East Hub is to capitalize on ongoing infrastructure and development to create a cultural heart and soul for Bellevue, transforming Bellevue into an amazing world-class destination for arts and culture. We believe Bellevue will lead the way to make the East Side a creative, thriving place to live and work. As you may know, seed funding from Microsoft enabled us to do a proof of concept. Now we are bringing it to the community to see what the community would like us to continue to build. As for me, I've chosen to serve on East Hub's board of directors because one, it's personal for me. I live and work here. My children went to school in this community and I want the best for this community. I think we have an opportunity to create a legacy, transforming Bellevue into a great city for future generations. And so I'm really excited to be a part of this effort and thank you for the time tonight. I'll pass it back to Ray. Thank you, Elka. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. So what East Hub is all about is, is placemaking. Um, 
there's a lot of definitions for placemaking. I like to think about it as a collaborative process uh, by which we cooperate to shape our community um, and to emphasize all of the wonderful cultures that are here and, and bring them together uh, across platforms. Um, we're often asked these four questions you see in front of us. Um, I'd just like to address them real quick. Uh, what are the conditions we're responding to? Condition one is the incredible growth of the very diverse communities in Bellevue that are the energy that are providing kind of the fuel for the growth. Uh, number two is, is the lack or um, loss of some existing cultural infrastructure spaces that as the East Side has developed, we've um, either, they've sort of been subsumed by the development or, or left behind. Uh, why now? is because uh, there's this rather urgent window of opportunity uh, to take advantage of. The, this incredible wave of development is happening. The time to uh, make sure that we include a cultural heart and soul in what we're doing is now because it's very hard to go back in once the wave of development has crested and receded uh, and try to reverse engineer in cultural infrastructure. Um, and number four, why East Hub is the, is the right organization to do this? I would say there's a few reasons. Um, we have on our staff and our board some really key expertise that we'll talk about a little bit. We have a, a vision that uh, we think takes in all of the community, not just where it is, but where it needs to go in order to have this art and culture soul. Um, and uh, we also think that because we are not an arts organization ourselves. We don't have an agenda in terms of arts and culture other than supporting it and uh, uh, creating spaces and creating access that we are a good honest broker um, to act between all of the different constituencies that need to be engaged in order to make this happen. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I don't have to tell you, this group, about the, the that there's more reasons to pursue an art and culture infrastructure like this than just because it's good for our heart and soul. There's um, really tangible proof of the economic benefits of an arts and culture uh, infrastructure ecosystem embedded into your community. I do want to point out there's there's local numbers we can point to, there's statewide numbers, but nationally, a lot of people don't quite understand that arts and culture does represent a very huge part of this substantial part of the national GDP. Uh, and and uh, although it varies from place to place, um, basically for every dollar invested or spent in arts and culture, there's a $9 return to the community, to the economy. Uh, and that's actually a bit of an old figure. We think it's a little bit higher now. Um, next slide, please. Um, we were uh, founded to think about a new way to develop arts and culture infrastructure. And one of the challenges we've also taken on is how we develop uh, our arts and culture uh, non-for-profits in, uh, in a new way, how we build these organizations from the ground up. Uh, to help us out with that, we uh, have the great good fortune to be working with one of the top voices in, in EDI and anti-racism right now, a gentleman named Michael J. Bobbitt, who's going to talk to you in just a minute. Um, Michael, I uh, make him blush, was just chosen to be the director, uh, I'm sorry, uh, CEO of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, which means he's the highest ranking arts and culture uh, officer in the whole state of Massachusetts. He spends his days speaking to uh, groups of politicians, so I figured we'd have him spend his nights doing that as well. Uh, so, Michael, if you would take it from here. Thank you so much, Ray. Good to see you. Um, and thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor Robinson and council members. I am um, zooming in from Cambridge, Massachusetts right now, where it is very close to bedtime, so I'll, I'll speak very briefly, um, but I'm really thrilled to be here. As Ray mentioned, I run the state arts agency that provides funding to, and services to arts and culture and humanities and science organizations in the whole state, funded primarily um, by budget appropriations from the state legislation. And really all day and every day, I am working hard to support and in many ways save a whole sector um, from some of the crises that we are experiencing now. COVID and the country's racial equity, uh, racial reckoning has exposed numerous issues with not only the inequities that exist in the arts and culture sector, but 
Also issues in the sector's nonprofit business model, which I think also contribute to the racial inequities. What's so great about what East Hub is proposing is that it, we are taking advantage of this terrific opportunity that you have in your city. Um, but, the, but the idea is incorporating it um, and considering anti-racism and also the strained business model that nonprofits exist on and redesigning it. Uh, I think Ray and East Hub have some really pioneering ideas that are entrepreneurial and innovative and involves the racially diverse community that exists in Bellevue, which seems to be part of what makes Bellevue Bellevue. And the truth is many of us can point to the arts and culture organizations that we know and how many of them are actually surviving. Most of them are probably struggling. And I think this is inherent in their business practices. Um, businesses in the arts and creativity sector are predominantly white because they were designed to be that way. They were designed by white people for white people. It's the basis of their business model. And most of the time, organizations try to fix the diversity problem with programs and policy shifts like discount tickets and outreach programs. And those things don't work. There has to be a massive culture shift. And what East Hub is proposing is essentially having multicultural people design a business model for multicultural people which means that it really has to sort of re-examine the best practices that we traditionally use in the nonprofit business model. And in a way that looks at every single thing that we do through an anti-racism and multicultural lens. As Ray pointed out in the last slide that we all know the economic impact and the, qual uh, on, and the quality of life that the arts and culture brings. But one of the messages I've been sharing with Massachusetts legislators is that both diversity and arts consumption really makes Massachusetts more competitive um, because the workforce and their exposure to multicultural arts really breeds a state that has vast perspective and lots of creative workers. And I think that is what you want. Um, so it's a very exciting project and I hope that um, once we iron out the kinks, we can bring it over to Massachusetts um, and hopefully we'll, we'll do that someday. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, this presentation over to our Director of Cultural Connections, Sadeshna Dixit. Thank you, Michael. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm the Director of Cultural Connections at East Hub. Um, I joined in February, and I'm absolutely loving my job because, firstly, I find it extremely meaningful as it combines my passion for arts and technology and user experience with a lot of other work I'm doing in the nonprofit world. And um, I get to talk to some really amazing people, which is, um, that's, I'm, I can't believe that that's my job. Um, um, I've worked closely with Michael um, in the past few months to create a consensus organizing based model. Um, he did allude to it briefly, but basically what we're going to do is hire black indigenous and people of color from within the East Side communities who will do some extensive outreach with arts and culture organizations, residents, uh, faith-based organizations, businesses, schools, and any other, other organizations that will help us understand the cultural landscape of the East Side. Um, and our aim is to be build really deep, um, authentic relationships and partnerships with uh, residents and stakeholders and external influencers, and ultimately understand gaps and overlaps and the immediate needs and wants of the community and which would ultimately lead to revealing opportunities and activating diversity to build inclusion and uh, accessible places that people will actually use. Um, so that's my job and I'm very excited to be on this journey and feel free to reach out to me with any questions. And if you know of any organization we should talk to, I would love to hear uh, about that. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Ray. Thank you, Sudeshna. Can I get the next slide, please? Yeah, so as Sudeshna mentioned, community is where we start and where we end. Um, this graphic's a little long, it should, uh, wrong. It should start with residents and end with residents. Um, but uh, our goal is to bring together these five different constituencies that make up the East Side. The businesses and the community leaders, arts and cultural organizations, civic leaders, the city governments uh, that uh, uh, dot the East Side, developers who are building all of these new developments, and uh, residents. We have a kind of a, a process that we go to uh, where we actually start with the community. We talk to them about the kind of spaces that they're interested in having. Uh, that's one of the promises that we make. We're not dictating to the community what we're giving them. We're asking them what they want. 
with that information, we go and, and we work with the city. And I have to just call out Jesse and Scott for the incredible partners and receptive audience they've been as we've, we've talked about what it is that we're trying to do, the openness to um, consider ways to do it, um, to incentivize developers to, to include cultural spaces as the heart of their developments. Uh, so we start with residents, we go to the city, we move on to developers to hopefully get them to uh, make some space available to us, whether it's new space and existing and new space and existing developments or existing space that we can repurpose into cultural spaces. Once we have the space, we go back to the community to talk about with this space in this location that's this size, what's the best usage of it with that information. We go to the fundraising community to raise the money to build and outfit these spaces. And then East Hub operates these spaces for the community in an efficient and uh, self-sustaining way. Next slide, please. As Scott referenced, we do have some great conversations ongoing with the city of Bellevue. Uh, Scott mentioned the website portal, which we're very excited to be doing. It's also a great entree for us to the arts and culture groups on the in Bellevue and on the east side to uh, a tool for us to outreach to them and, and to actually offer them something in return for their collaboration. We are very much interested in the cultural corridor, the Grand Connection, uh, creating uh, the entire city of Bellevue as a cultural district. I had a great chat this morning with my friend Patrick Bannon from the BDA about how we can work together with the BDA. Um, to really bring that culture, that uh, grand connection to life in terms of cultural experiences along the way. Uh, we see lots of potential opportunities for the future. Scott referenced the Bellwether Arts Festival that we're already thinking about how we can add a live programmatic performance to it. We can get the word out about it. We can help find sponsorship to really put that, that really wonderful festival on the map. Uh, and we're talking about other initiatives. Um, uh, what you see there, a central administrative hub for city-owned facilities. There are some facilities, cultural facilities that the city has already that, that we have some great ideas about how to activate and use more and get more community investment in. Uh, and we're also particularly interested in the Bell Red Corridor and how we can really put some teeth into that arts and culture district, both in terms of creating cultural space and hopefully some opportunities for affordable housing as we go. Uh, next slide, please. And, and the goal is a, a citywide cultural district. And, and this is kind of a, a, a new definition of cultural district. For those of you who went on the BDA tour a couple of years ago, we toured and we walked through Dallas's cultural district. Um, traditionally, a cultural district has been a two or three block radius where you keep all the culture. Um, my, our vision of a cultural district is a citywide activated space. Uh, where cultural experiences are happening all the time, where there's activation, where people are taking in arts and culture messages without even knowing that they're doing so. Um, we're, we're hoping to create all of downtown Bellevue as a cultural district. We think there's benefits to this. It creates communities where people uh, want to live and stay and not just work and go home. It can, creates connections between people who are uh, interacting with each other within these venues, outside of these venues, in restaurants before and after the venues. Uh, and it also creates opportunities for these kind of cross-cultural uh, conversations and exposure that we would love to see happening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you probably have heard our, our first big uh, project, and, and we are starting with probably the biggest thing we will ever do. Um, is this uh, Cloudview Playhouse. This comes thanks to an incredible donation by Mr. Lawrence Louis of uh, Stanford Hotels Corporation, who's building this uh, three, six, 600 uh, foot tower development, Cloudview, right down 110th Street. Uh, we really see 110th Street and the intersection of the Grand Connection becoming like the 42nd and Broadway. Of, Bell, of Bellevue, the new town center with Amazon there, with the light rail there, with City Hall there, with the Braeburn there. We feel like the Cloudview Playhouse uh, is going to be a really a great addition to what we see as a great major thoroughfare for the city. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a quick uh, walkthrough of the space. I don't know how it's showing up on your screens. 
this is crossing the street from 100 and uh, crossing 110th Street into the lobby. That sort of white mesh you see is a programmable um, mesh that sort of takes video images and uh, static art images. We hope the venue itself will be an art piece. Moving into the venue, you'll see uh, this is one of the, we think, seven or eight setups of the venue. This one is for live music with a dance floor. Uh, and this is with its thousand seat capacity fully realized. There's a number of other settings which we'll go through in just a minute. Um, we're also uh, hoping to create this lovely outdoor uh, area for performances, for gatherings, uh, Braeburn's across the street. That's 110th Street where those cars are moving down towards City Hall. And that's the new Amazon 600 complex uh, right behind us to our left. Um, because of Mr. Louis's donation, which is about $44 million worth of value as re was referenced earlier, the venue is gonna be a great deal cheaper to build and realize than a traditional standalone arts uh, facility would be. There's things that are being built for the whole uh, complex, including parking and infrastructure and connections, a site clearing, all that work is, is being wonderfully donated by Mr. Louis. And it's just our job to build and realize the space. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said, flexibility is the key to this space. We see um, up to eight different setups of the inside. You can see some of them here. In the upper left, there's a, a more of a theater in the round sort of setting. That's about 350 capacity. The thousand seat capacity just to the right of that for live music events, for galas, for things like that. Down on your bottom left is a more traditional theatrical setup for spoken word events, for theater, for musical theater. We also see the lobby itself as a wonderful community gathering space. I, I do not think theater should ever be locked. I think they should be open all day long. I, I, what we're aiming to create is a community center in the truest sense of the word, a center for that the community comes to and gathers. Uh, this very expensive lobby space we see is a wonderful place for um, exhibition uh, of all different sorts of things and experiences. We're hoping that people just come and hang out in our space. We would like nothing more than to be embraced by the community in that way. Um, flexibility is actually the key to everything that we are doing. Next slide, please. Cloud is only one of the spaces we're looking to develop and we're having active conversations with developers in Bellevue and all over the east side with the goal of creating rehearsal rooms, classrooms, recital halls, black box theaters, reception and community spaces. Uh, the idea being that downtown Bellevue is the downtown of the east side. The more finished performance spaces would sit and live in that area. Uh, as we move out into the other cities on the east side, more community-based spaces for dance classes and, and art exhibitions and, and gathering spaces of all different kinds. Um, we, uh, we like very much uh, the idea of following where the light rail is because we feel access to these spaces is very important uh, for breaking down barriers to entry. Um, and we're, uh, we're, we're, as we say, we're working now to get all kinds of buy-in, both from the community groups who are going to use them, the developers who are hopefully going to work with us to give us the space. Uh, I have learned just through trial and error from the many projects I've worked on in the country and internationally that if you don't get buy-in for the spaces from the community first, it doesn't matter what you build, people aren't going to use them. Uh, next slide. One of the questions we get is, uh, who pays? How do these things support themselves? Um, Obviously, we're going to be building the spaces using a traditional uh, capital campaign, although it's not capital focused on one single project. It's capital money that we're raising to execute um, projects all over the east side, so not any one single thing. Once we're open, though, we do believe that we can be self-sustaining. We have There's five real distinct sources of revenue, ticket sales for what's happening inside the venues, sponsorships of the venues themselves, uh, government support of specific programs, not operating support, but support for programs that the city of Bellevue very much wants to have that inside of venues that, that add to the richness and diversity of offerings in the community. Uh, program usage and rental fees from users uh, of the spaces, and of course, traditional fundraising, which is family, corporation, and foundation giving to support the uh, expenses of operating the whole thing. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, we do see a whole bunch of different groups of users for the spaces. We uh, Arts and culture groups are obviously people that we're having ongoing conversations with. We had a lovely chat the other day with the Bellevue schools uh, who see themselves, I think, as a great user of these spaces. Uh, we do see them having a bit of a commercial use for uh, corporate events uh, to help sort of the bottom line of how these places are run, but done under very strict usage guidance, guidance in terms of who gets priority in the space. Uh, independent educators, teachers who wanna uh, run dance classes, art classes, theater classes in these spaces, and obviously the community at large. And um, the other main initiative that we would talk about after the spaces is East Hub offering support to arts and culture groups in Bellevue and on the East side. And by support, I mean the things that aren't glamorous uh, that we can hopefully take off the hands of these arts and culture organizations to allow them to spend a good deal less money on them uh, and to have a higher level of work done and to allow them to really concentrate their efforts on their mission, on producing their art and on engaging their communities. So those services would be back office, marketing, accounting, database management, all the not fun stuff uh, that arts and culture groups do need to have done for them, but aren't the focus of their missions. Um, and with that, uh, next slide. Thank you guys very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. Thank you, City Manager Miyaki. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, uh, City Council. Uh, happy to take any questions or listen to any comments you have about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. Thank you. I really enjoyed that presentation. I like the multiple players. That's awesome. Um, Council Member Stokes, I'm going to start with you and then I'll open it up. If you, people want to raise their hand, I'll call on you. So Council Member Stokes, would you like to start us off? Yes, I will. I'd be delighted to. Um, I've been dreaming about arts and culture and how, what, how we do things in Bellevue. And for, since I, before I came on Council, when I came on Council and you all know the work I, I've doing on that and been involved with the and, and liaison the arts commission for a long time and um this is this is kind of you know when you when you do that and you work on things you know you have a community that is is wanting to go forward and you know 2012 is a totally different world in a sense in bellevue than 2021 but I think what we're talking about now is, is a culmination of all the thoughts that have been going on over this time period. And, uh, you know, I've gone on every one of the BDA trips. And one of the things we always do is go out and look at the cultural facilities and learned a lot from that. Uh, fortunately, two times um, in the East, and the last one was in Dallas, and I think it was uh, in California uh, before. Uh, when you when you go out to the, and I'll, I'll try to wrap it up quickly, when you go out uh, there you have a chance to talk to people and I talked to Ray and we and other people who've been involved in the arts and looking at the great opportunity we have on, on Bellevue on the east side uh it, it was really exciting that we talked about some of these concepts but um I I'm very uh hopeful with this and and I think it it the concept and the uh opportunity as is outlined I think gives us a chance to really move this forward and be a real leader in the area in the state, frankly, um, in, in doing this. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of, uh, you know, uh, focus. I'm also very pleased that this is coming at a time when the focus on equity and focus on community building of community of all people in Bellevue and the region is part of this. Um, so, uh, and, and we had a very, very good meeting uh, um, presentation with the park, with the Arts Commission. They were very enthusiastic about this. Um, getting the support of, of some of the heavy hitters in the business world already is, is a good sign. Uh, getting um, people really excited about this and leading to the day when you can go in any place in Bellevue and find a place of, of arts or, or a place to sit down and chat about uh, your culture, ch chat about arts and everything, um, and then go to places where you have great performances, uh, to me is is um, something that's going to elevate uh, Bellevue uh, and really add to the growth we've had in 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 uh, approach, you know, in in livability in Bellevue. So I'm I'm very excited about this, and um, 
looking forward to seeing how we can continue to work for it. I want to congratulate um, and thank uh, Jesse and uh, and Scott for working on this. And as you know, I've always believed in and, and firmly believe now that um, you know arts and, and culture is um, is a really important is is a important economic driver. But it's it's something that's more than economics. It's it's the, it's a it's a soul driver. It's it's something that uh, really makes the city really does make it the place you want to be. So um, I'm very excited about it, and a uh, uh, little uh, stop here and uh, listen to the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Um, is any, are there any other comments? Um, I see Councilmember Barksdale, and I see Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. I see Councilmember Zahn. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, and I see Councilmember Lee. Go ahead, Councilmember Barksdale. Uh, so Deputy Mayor had his hand up, virtual hand up before I did, so I'll pass him first, if that's okay. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Oh, well, well, thank you, uh, Councilmember Barksdale. Appreciate that. Um, very courteous of you. Um, yeah, fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, this is one of the best presentations we've had this year. I'll, I'll fully admit that. It just the outstanding board, Ray, that you've put together here, uh, many with, you know, real strong local roots or strong expertise is just, is just really amazing. And um, I am so excited about this work, as Councilmember Stokes had, had, had just said. And, you know, you, you check so many of the box here. Um, you know, the, the, the economic benefits are clear uh, in terms of the $9 return on the $1 uh, invested, the commitment to the EDI and the anti-racism, the diversity of the arts and what makes this city competitive, the, the, and the, the starting with the residents, ending with the residents. Um, the community engagement is outstanding. Um, and something that we're always hanging our hat on is that that community engagement and, and, and always focusing and centering the residents of the city. Um, and then really taking advantage of what and building on what we already do well here in Bellevue in terms of like the Bellwether Arts Festival and then taking advantage of the cultural corridor with the grand connection. So we're just keep building and building and hopefully creating something that is unique, something that is sustainable and something that is going to further establish a thriving uh, arts uh, community and cultural community in Bellevue that I think as a council, we're all really eager for. Um, so having said all that, I wanted to ask you, couple of quick questions in terms of, um, and this almost turns into an opportunity for you for, for a pitch for, for sponsors, but I'm curious, you know, how many sponsors do you think it's going to take um, or family foundations to be involved? And then, and then, and then uh, what is the, the, the ticket sales, et cetera? I guess what I'm getting at is like, you know, what, what does success look like in order for this to be a sustainable model for many, many years? Because certainly I think you've got the momentum. Um, you've got an incredible partner here uh, in terms of uh, Mr. Louie, but what does this look like going forward once it's established? Uh, it's hard to know the answer to that okay. until we know exactly how many people we have who are willing to work with us. Uh, the more people, the more spaces that we can have, the more we can amortize the cost of operating the spaces over, over more uh, opportunities to make revenue. Um, the key to the whole model, however, is the flexibility. It's what mm -hmm. we're promising the developers. Uh, the reason that they want to work with us is because they're looking for activated space. Um, so the way we are building and designing these buildings is with inherent flexibility built in so that you can have one production one night and then a completely different production and a completely different setup the next night. Um, there's no two weeks of dark time as you, as you close something down, load it out, and move the next thing in. Uh, what we're promising the developers is 200 to 250 nights of events of activated spaces. Um, key to that also then is creating duplicate uh, rehearsal spaces so that the next group to come into the theater has a place to stage to get ready to come in. Um, that'll be part of what we're developing in the, in the model. But so the answer to your question is different than a traditional campaign where they're building a building and they know how much it's going to be and how long it's going to take. Um, we're we're an ongoing campaign and we're going to take advantage of opportunity as it presents itself and we will scale the organization appropriately. Um, 
I, I wish I could give you more specifics about it's going to cost X amount of dollars. It's going to take it X amount of time. We know how much we think the cloud view project is going to cost. We know how much time we have to raise the money to do it. We feel very confident that we can do it. Um, as the word gets out about what it is that we're doing, we think we will have more adherence. Uh, we are having wonderful meetings with some of the biggest names, obviously, that you can imagine on the on the east side, both corporate and 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 uh, residents. Um, mm -hmm. We're uh, we decided that rather than kicking off with fundraising, we would pick off kick off with proof of concept, and we would try to get some points on the board to prove that what we were doing was viable and needed and necessary. Now that I think that we've done that, I think we've reached that threshold. Um, now is when the serious work of fundraising begins. Terrific. Thank you, Ray. And thank you again, Council Member Barksdale. All right, Council Member Barksdale. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ray and Elk and uh, Sundeshna and Michael, this is awesome. I mean, I'm Ray, I remember having conversations with you like a couple years ago about just being, just talking about community and arts and so forth, and just glad to see you know, so much of what you've presented today in the vision and mission. So um, I would say as someone who grew up in the art scene, so I grew up singing and playing instruments, playing in the band and singing in choirs and such, it's, it's in addition to the connections and the sense of belonging that that fosters through bringing the different cultures together and, and um, helping to build those relationships through a shared um, platform, if you will. I think it's also life-changing because a lot of um, people, like especially our youth who may find that expression through the arts as life-changing for them. And so I'm excited for um, what this will bring to Bellevue. I'm also excited for the nightlife as, uh, as the economic development team knows that I, I talk about a lot. Um, and so I, one question for you in terms of uh, a platform for independent artists who maybe are um, providing courses. I took lessons from, from an instructor for when I learned piano and trumpet. And so just curious about what sort of platform exists for those folks. Well, as I mentioned that, uh, yes, we're doing these kind of larger scale finished performance spaces, but the plans are for as we move out of downtown Bellevue is community based spaces to be used by just those purposes, independent teachers, you know, the, the one of the very first things that got me talking about this and thinking about this was when um, some representatives of the dance community came to me and they said, you know, we, there's all these young boys and girls who want to learn how to dance and there's no place for them to learn how to dance. And there's wonderful teachers and there's all kinds of companies and we're just being priced out and moved out of the storefronts we were in because that strip mall was torn down. And that was actually the very first thing that got me attuned to the fact that that, that level of space is a necessity. It's what it's what creates investment in the arts. People people value arts because they understand it. Because they had a. I, I went into arts because I happened to grow up in a place where there was an embedded cultural infrastructure and support, and so it became a career option for me because of what I experienced because of where I grew up. Um, that's what we need to create here on the east side, um, especially with all of the different cultures and peoples moving in, there has to be opportunity for expression of that. And it has to be seen as a, as a viable career, whether it's a career path or a hobby path, but just a connection, a tangible connection to the arts is, is the thing that, that is driving us to do what we're doing. It's what we want to create. Awesome. Thanks for all the work that you're doing and thanks for leading with anti-racism. I appreciate it. Council members on. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I also um, am very, very excited about East Hub and, and what you're doing. I mean, to me, you know, the culture creates community and that this is a citywide effort really resonates. So it's about how we really embed arts and culture within our community. And what I think about is that you know, we're an innovative city and certainly the arts spurs innovation. So to the degree that we embed even more and more art in our community, it's gonna create even a more vibrant space for innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, much broader than just even the arts itself. So I think that that's a really important piece. I guess my um, question would be, as we think about the journey 
it will take a few years to have the fundraising in place to build out the playhouse at Cloud View. So in the meantime, as you think about these additional spaces, and I was particularly struck by your comment about activating city owned properties. And I would love to see City Hall when we reopen after COVID, um, have a lot more art exhibitions in the walls. I would love to see it in our conference rooms, um, in our community centers, so that instead of waiting for spaces to be built out, let's use the spaces that we have. And how do we create the opportunities for artists that have not been able to um, display their art for people that have been um, you know, sheltered at home? How do we actually get that going? So as we come out of and are together again in community that we have spaces where we can celebrate all of the different local artists that we have. And I would say, especially with our students and our youth where it would be amazing if there was more spaces for them to be able to um, gather in community and show off their arts. Um, and then I also think about the culinary arts. So I wonder if that is also part of this work because uh, I think that so much of, of art is also in food and maybe I just love to eat, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I, I think about of, as you think about these spaces, whether uh, the culinary is also uh, a big part of that. And um, yeah, just how we create those cross platforms where um, it, it becomes the very air that we breathe. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just super excited about what you're doing. Um, and also the partnerships you already have with uh, Rita, Rita uh, with Tasbir. They've been very active in the community with uh, theater and movies. And then I wasn't as familiar with Tabor 100 doing this work, but certainly they're very connected with our black community and businesses. So if they're engaged in arts and culture, I think that's great. I didn't realize that was something that they had uh, branched into. Um, we had a great conversation earlier today with uh, hopefully a very substantial potential partner for us, just about this whole idea of taking advantage of opportunities to create pop-up art. Um, I lived in New York in the 90s, and, and when uh, that was one of the great memorable things that happened then was as there was a wave of development that hit New York, old buildings were, were taken down, new buildings were put up in their space, in their place, but there was this interregnum period between when the old things were condemned and emptied where artists were allowed just to take over spaces and turn them into wonderful, incredible, interesting, immersive art exhibition spaces. And walking down the streets in New York City between, say, 1994 and 1996 was an unforgettable experience because you never knew what you would come up across. Um, I do think there's there's opportunities for that. And some of the most exciting artwork that you can have is opportunistic use of, of a fleeting space or a fleeting moment um, to do something interesting and, and profound. Uh, art on the east side is one of the easiest things to talk about just because the east side has such a tradition of, of visual arts, um, of arts festivals and arts fairs. Um, and and it, that's going to be, an, I think, an easy thing to take advantage of, to reignite, and to really use to put, to put the place on the map. As for culinary, uh, haven't thought about that yet. Um, I do think of art as the expression of culture. Culture is is religion and dress and cooking and, and language, um, but art is the artifacts that culture makes that we then share with each other. Um, so there's probably a place for, for that. Uh, I'll have to think about that. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Hi, Ray. How are you? Hello. <laughs> good. Very impressive presentation. Uh, good work you've done. Uh, you know, this is a great uh, economic development vision you've laid uh, in front of uh, all of us and for the east side, and not just the east side. East side, I think, is the future for the whole region. So I think you're doing something really uh, with technology, you know, with the global exposure, businesses and talents and community that we have. 
And so, as you know, arts is a, a common language and common tool, you know, to bring people together. So I think this is a great, great vision you've laid out. Uh, very impressed. So my thought is that, you know, you know, there's some emphasis on technology. Actually, the word cloud view, you know, I was talking to uh, Lawrence Lee. I mentioned that the east side is the cloud computing center of the world. <laughs> Amazon, Microsoft, you know, they're all here. And uh, T-Mobile. Uh, so indeed, I think it represents uh, the future and the econ economic engine that this region represents. And I think art and culture really provides the common language and common tool, you know, to uh, make this exciting place. Uh, as, as a result, I think, you know, really it's a great economic uh, development vision. Uh, my uh, comment maybe it's just making sure that we have the community because that's one of the things you mentioned, how to connect people together. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the table 100, you know, that's uh, one great uh, uh, culture community. And uh, also obviously uh, you're working with chamber, you know, and the other, uh, we talked about earlier, you know, Asian American communities, 39% of the population uh, in Bellevue. Wow. And so in the East side, it's just, as, you know, proportional uh, and it's growing, that's important. So I think uh, it's important to uh, in not to uh, leave them, uh, sort of miss them. And I think there's a lot of folks and especially myself knowing uh, how many uh, talents, you know, have come to the United States, to this region uh, from, from, from China, from, the, from Asia. Uh, and uh, these folks, uh, they are concentrated here and many of them are really top, top uh, uh, caliber. I know of people who used to be, you know, what they call class one uh, talents in performing art and dancing. They came to uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet and they, you know, they're very good. And so these are the folks that can really bring the world together, as we know. You know, it's all here uh, from Europe, from South America, from Africa, from everywhere almost. And so I think we really have a very rich in those talents. And let's, you know, uh, make sure we take advantage of those talents and uh, recognize them and cultivate them and encourage them. Sometimes the culture sometimes prevents them because they're new you know, to our country, to our community. So they need to have people like us, you, to bring them up, bring them up, give them the opportunity to develop them. I think that's where we can really enjoy and appreciate, you know, the great things that we bring from all over the world, you know, to Bellevue, to the east side. So yeah, good well, job. That's, that's actually what's going to, when we talk about creating a distinctive cultural destination, um, that's that's the that's the fuel for that. Um, we want to make Bellevue its own individual distinct cultural destination, different than what you can find in Seattle, because we want to give people a reason from all over, from Seattle, from all over the East Side to come to experience culture here. Um, and the engine for that is the diversity here and the collaborations that can happen between Seattle-based groups and and local groups, between international touring groups and local groups, and just between the, the local groups themselves and giving them yeah. a real showcase. I don't know whether you know the story of, you know, uh, Paul Allen, you know, was very much interested in music, right? Yeah. He's, it's a, he plays a lot of guitar, or played. And he actually started a project to bring musicians from all over the world to come to his music experimental project in Seattle Center. Yeah. You know, people bring their own instrument, just bring them all together, sit in one room, just play music, express the feeling. And it's amazing what that will present to share with each other, with their own instrument, the way they make sound to me music. And this is what Yo-Yo Ma does. He plays this cello, traditional Western instrument, but he plays with people who plays a Chinese a flute. Yes. You know, whatever. And that's the thing that bring people together, makes beautiful sounds, you know, cross culture communication. That's what it means to be cross culture. 
right? It doesn't matter whether you do it through art, culture, or technology, or whatever, but it's the opportunity to bring it together. And that's what really counts. So Thank I you. like what you agree. bring up. Strongly Jake. agree. Thank you, Councilmember Lee. Um, I'm gonna speak and then Councilmember Robertson, did you wanna have a chance to speak as well? Why don't you go ahead and then I'll go after you. Thank you. Um, no, good conversation. Um, great presentation. I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm just, I have a question for staff. Um, uh, and that is, how does this um, plan work into our study and desire for more multicultural space, particularly our cross-cultural center? Um, because it seems like this would be another third place, this and PACE. Um, would have another third place. And I just love the idea of these arts popping up. I know that um, Pace has the, um, they're having pop-up art all uh, in Red Redmond and Bellevue um, where musicians just show up in public spaces. I think it's great. Um, we need more of that. And this is an example of more of that and a lot more of that. It's really exciting. So um, I'm wanting to know how this is will be this idea will be integrated in our planning for more parks our planning for more cultural space etc cetera, etc cetera. so someone from staff could answer that because even if it's a private uh or nonprofit promote uh proposal it's gonna serve the people of our region yeah i'm happy to hop hop in um sure. Sebastian will be leading this oh. she have michael she meant city staff Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. City staff. <laughs> yeah. Great. Councilmember Robertson, I can tackle that one really briefly. And we are we are thinking about how East Hub and Pace and others in, interact with and integrate with uh, the work that is happening around the multicultural center and other facilities. Um, I am not uh, directly on the cross cultural center facilities team, but I, if Michael Shiyasaki is available, he may be able to speak a little bit more in depth. But we are we are looking for opportunities for alignment and collaboration on those types of projects. That is perfect. I'm glad to hear that because I think it's a really great opportunity for us to do so. So thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. So I just, like I said, I love this presentation and um, this is such a great night. We have parks, we have arts, and then we have next affordable housing. Um, so all my favorite subjects, but I have to say, um, I happened upon that little beehive thing at the Bellevue Botanical Gardens and I was not expecting it. And it did everything that you hope things like that will do. It surprised us, it delighted us. That door is actually pretty small. It's about three feet tall. So you have to really convince yourself to go inside this dark space. But once you're in there, the light, the way the light shines is just fantastic. And you know, we have this wonderful experience, my friend and I, unexpected experience. And it, I took pictures inside. It was really beautiful. And I just thought that's that's what I want more of in Bellevue. I just want more of those uh, pop-up art experiences where you don't expect it, but it's just, it's a real pleasant thing. So um, I'm excited. Um, I am I think there's a tremendous value in maintaining some sort of a arts calendar so that people, if they have a free night can go to one place and find out what's available throughout Bellevue. And I, it sounds like you may be doing something like that, which I'd be excited about. Um, I love your calling the cultural corridor. Uh, I never heard the Grand Connection called that before and I really like it. So uh, that's great. And then kind of what council member Robertson was asking, I'm wondering how, how do we connect the existing spaces like Pacific Northwest Ballet speed, Space, you know, they have a studio a public studio space in that facility. How do we connect to that? And how do we connect to future projects uh, that we are looking forward to like PACE? So how, how do you see that happening? Well, we're big supporters of the all the big arts organizations, PACE, Pacific Northwest Ballet. Uh, excuse me, we feel that uh, when we are successful, uh, we are going to contribute to their success. Uh, in, in the case of Pacific Northwest Ballet, their ongoing success. In the case of PACE, their future success of, of building the building. Because what we're doing is hopefully creating uh, an arts and culture base of people who are interested in, in participating and coming to see stuff. Uh, and also, as I said earlier, creating 
Bellevue and the east side is a destination for arts and culture. That has the effect of bringing more people to the area to experience arts and culture. That, that is going to naturally lead to increased foot traffic through the Bellevue Art Museum, through the PACE facility when it opens, um, and curiosity about everything that's here. Um, it's not just, there's not just one pie that you divide up into a certain number of pieces. And, and if I get a piece, you don't. Um, our goal is, is, I don't know if it's to cook more pies or cook one bigger pie, but it's, it's, to, um, it's, to, it's to create the sense of this area and the reality of, of this city and this area as a hub for arts and culture, as a hot place to be. And we think that that is going to move mountains to benefit everybody else who lives and works in the arts and culture field here. And we are happy to sit down and talk to and partner with anyone and everybody who's interested. Well, great. And I think Cloudview, the theater is a wonderful place to start. That's, that's just amazing to have that kind of support for that. So thank you very much. Um, looking forward to the next installment of presentation from you. And I'm hoping to see more pop-up art throughout Bellevue. Me too. So with that, uh, we're going to take a break. It is 8.01. We will reconvene at 8.11. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good to see y'all. Thank you. Would you like to introduce our last study, study session item, please? Sure, Mayor. <clears throat> so um, tonight, uh, the council received another scheduled briefing in line with the uh, House Bill 1590 work plan. Um, just by way of background, as council might uh, remember, the council enacted resolution 9826 on October 12th of 2020, which allows Bellevue to collect a 10th percent sales tax for affordable housing and behavioral health services under state law. <clears throat> Tonight, um, staff is seeking council direction to initiate a request for proposal process to identify uh, behavioral health um, services as well as housing related services and to be funded by HB 1590 revenue. Staff also seeks some um, preliminary feedback on the other areas of information covered in this presentation this, this evening. So joining us tonight is uh, Matt Cummins, the Director of the Community Development Department. He is joined by Stephanie Martinez, Homeless Outreach Coordinator, as well as Lisa Olson, uh, Management Fellow, both from the City Manager's Office, as well as by Tony Esparza, the Assistant Director in the Parks and Community Services Department. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Mac. Thank you, City Manager Miyake, uh, Mayor, members of the council. It's good to be back with you here this evening um, talking about House Bill 1590 and the implementation plan um, for both the ability to spend money on human services, which we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about tonight, uh, and the creation of new affordable housing for our most vulnerable populations in the community. So um, I'm joined this evening with uh, uh, our project managers, Lisa Olson, Stephanie Martinez, um, and then Tony Esparza from our uh, uh, Parks and Community Services Department is here to specifically talk about uh, what we envision to be a pretty exciting opportunity to spend some of the 1590 money because there's an immediate need that we think we can meet uh, and wanna talk to the council about that. So uh, if we go to the next slide, the specific request of the council this evening is to initiate an RFP that would immediately allow folks, um, uh, groups that provide those types of mental and behavioral health services, as well as housing related services um, to potentially access the 1590 monies in this year. And we're gonna talk a little bit tonight about the overall funding stream, uh, the amount that we're proposing the council consider dedicating to the uh, human services, um, and then the remainder would be for capital construction of new affordable housing. So tonight there's two things that are gonna happen. We're gonna give you an update on some things that we've been out doing and some feedback we've been getting from some of our um, housing providers around uh, themes that are coming for you all when you get into the capital uh, construction side of the 1590 work program. And then the second part will specifically be a request to initiate that RFP. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, overall, we are starting each of these study sessions with House Bill 1590 funding and what it's allowed to be funded for. There are some, some very specific um, populations that can be housed within the affordable housing itself. 
Uh, and then there are some requirements relating to the percentages of money. And so we'll talk about that. We always start with that slide. We'll talk a little bit about the work plan, uh, where we are. We've been coming back to the council every four to six weeks or so. We're still on that trajectory. And hopefully we'll be, uh, if the council makes decisions around the housing related services and mental behavioral services this evening, moving into the uh, provision of affordable housing, which is the other um, side of the, what 1590 allows. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what we've heard so far from outreach and engagement, including the high level themes. The, there are absolutely some relationships between the human services um, that are provided for and the types of populations that are um, going to be housed within um, projects that are, are partially or, or wholly funded by the 1590 revenue stream. So we're gonna talk to you all about that with the intent of uh, that leading into your next series of study sessions in June and July. And then we're gonna turn it over um, to Mrs. Sparza, who will be talking about the early wins opportunities uh, and, and looking at how we can um, spend some of that 1590 money. Um, and then we'll move into the next steps to wrap up. So if we go to the next slide, Liesl. Um, the most important thing to remember about the 1590 bill is that at least 60% of the money has to be spent on, on creating uh, physical facilities um, that serve populations at or below the 60% AMI threshold. Generally, um, that is gonna be 30% and below and then 30 to 60%. We are still looking into the various product types and the business models that are contained therein and you're gonna see those at your next study session. Um, the important part for tonight is that no more than 40% of that money can be spent on the operation delivery or evaluation of those uh, behavioral health treatment programs and or housing related services. We are proposing that 20% uh, of the monies be set aside for those um, services that generally lines up with the human services commission work from last year and the human services needs. It will be about a million uh, $800,000 and we'll walk through what we saw in our human services needs assessments before um, and what you're likely to see should you initiate the, the RFP this evening. And then the remainder of the money uh, would come back um, as part of the capital construction, which will be that 60% number you see on this slide. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. And I'm gonna hand it off to Liesl. Uh, there have been some changes to the state law. You got an update on that uh, from Joyce Nichols and team as it was moving through uh, the state legislature process. So I'm gonna hand it off to our project managers here to talk about those other, other things. Great, thank you, Mac. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and members of council. I'm glad to be presenting to you tonight. So as Mac mentioned, um, during the 2021 legislative session, um, House Bill 1070 passed and became effective, which expanded um, the use of this tax revenue for housing and related services. You'll see in those bullets, um, the main changes that we wanted to highlight for you tonight. The first one is um, the addition of acquiring a building or land for use for affordable housing, behavioral health services, or housing related services. And so that piece around acquisition um, of the building or land was the addition um, as part of House Bill 1070. In addition, affordable housing, the definition was expanded to include emergency, transitional or supportive housing options, which expands um, those uses that could be with, uh, used within Bellevue. And then lastly, the um, specific populations that need to be served by the 60% of funding was expanded um, from simply homeless families with children to persons who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, which um, still includes the families with children. So these expanded uses for the housing and related services are going to be incorporated into our upcoming work as we continue to develop the program and funding process recommendations for this 1590 work. So as Mac mentioned, this slide gives you an overview of the previous study sessions and the two items that we're bringing to you tonight around the stakeholder outreach and the request for proposals. You'll remember um, at our March study session that a lot of our conversations with stakeholders were focused on behavioral health and housing related services. And tonight's study session will be um, starting to focus more on the conversations we've had with both our affordable housing and for-profit um, developers within the community 
And we're excited that this will help guide um, and inform our upcoming work related to the capital side of the funding process. We'll also highlight um, some additional themes that we've heard from other out um, other stakeholders, specifically um, speaking to individuals with lived experience related to housing instability, the faith-based community, and culturally specific agencies. So the outreach and engagement that we did um, followed what we kind of continued from the March study session. So really working to identify the community need and um, the priority gaps that could be funded with HB 1590 funding, really working to understand the barriers and challenges um, that stakeholders see community members having uh, accessing those programs and services and how 1590 funding could work um, to really lessen those challenges. And then a continuation of our work around the best practices. So um, speaking with other jurisdictions to uh, ensure that we are really building out a comprehensive long-term program for House Bill 1590. So we'll go into the preliminary themes that we've heard related to affordable housing. You may see that some of these sound similar to what has been discussed before. And this really to us uh, reiterates the importance of housing with services to be able to serve these eligible populations. And this weaving together of the funding across housing and services is really the best way to support a household success in obtaining and maintaining that housing and really works to, um, to be adaptive and responsive to the changing needs of those um, populations who this funding will best serve. So the first theme is around gap funding. And uh, in conversations with our stakeholders, 1590 revenue can really be used to fill a continuum of potential types of funding gaps, whether that is um, upfront acquisition to the actual construction and operation, um, all of which are in limited supply. So this funding really provides that opportunity to close those gaps on projects that might otherwise not be able to move forward or enhance projects that are already underway by potentially buying down rents or creating that stable funding source for supportive services. And so this funding really can be, um, it provides a benefit to the community when it's used in conjunction with other funding sources Developing affordable housing at or below that 60% AMI um, median income is really going to always rely on multiple layering of funding sources. And so HB 1590 can really work to ensure that affordable housing is successful and best serving those eligible populations. The next theme is around land acquisition and preservation. We continue to hear from our stakeholders that the high land prices and availability of land is really a challenge to developing affordable housing in Bellevue. As I mentioned, um, acquiring land that could be used for affordable housing, behavioral health facilities or housing related uh, facilities is a newly expanded use of this funding. And so staff will return at an upcoming study session to prevent, uh, present additional information on a potential land acquisition strategy under House Bill 1590. In addition, um, acquiring and preserving at-risk at housing properties is really an effective option to retaining um, those cost-effective affordable housing throughout the community. And it really provides uh, an opportunity to have a more immediate impact on creating affordable housing units to really serve our most vulnerable community members. So with that, I will turn over the presentation uh, to Stephanie Martinez, our Homelessness Outreach Coordinator, to continue discussing the themes from our stakeholder outreach. All right, thank you, Liesl. So for the next um, theme that we've heard from our affordable housing stakeholders is the need for zero to 30% AMI housing in order to really create a range of housing choices and housing opportunities for our most underserved and most economically diverse households. There's really a need for this due to the limited supply, not just in Bellevue, but across our entire region. We know that there's a large gap between households at zero to 30% AMI and existing units to serve these households. And what we continue to hear from our stakeholders is the need for the additional public funding to create housing for individuals and families and households who have the greatest challenge finding affordable housing within the zero to 30% income range. In conversation with other jurisdictions as well that have already implemented the sales and use tax, there's also similar focus on providing affordable housing for very low and low income households. And what we continue to hear is that 
through providing zero to 30% AMI housing, we can continue to enhance our equity and accessibility for our most underserved communities. And again, for our most economically diverse residents. Next one. And service connected housing. So we continue to hear this within our last study session and this one, and particularly with our affordable housing developers, providers and operators, this continues to be a topic to note because during these conversations, we've really heard that there's an increased level of care needed at our existing affordable housing properties and really across our community-based agencies that serve our most vulnerable communities. These sort of supportive services could include and could be, could include things like mental and behavioral health services, substance use services falls within that, could be anything for employment services and so forth. And really these services can really enhance housing stability for a household and really support an individual. For example, let's say a household is transitioning from homelessness to housing and into permanent housing. Those individuals might need additional supports again, such as continued case management or enhanced case management, mental behavioral health supports, employment services, and so forth. And so there's this continued need to enrich our housing with services. Um, but we're also hearing that there's limited funding for staffing, staffing and operational costs for these types of services as well. And going on to the next one. So for mental and behavioral health services, as we know, mental health services really help households overall well-being because these services really look at the whole individual. What we've been hearing from our affordable housing developers, providers, and operators is that there's really an increased need in behavioral health services across the board. Again, not just at these properties, but across our community-based agencies that serve our most vulnerable communities. What we've heard through these conversations is that there's a need for behavioral health crisis support this could look anything from case management to counseling on site to enhanced access to treatments and assessments. Um, and again, by offering these types of services, either on site or connecting folks to these sort of services within our community, you're allowing that household to enhance their own housing stability and achieve self-sufficiency over time. And so what we also have been hearing though is that there's currently limited funding for this sort of robust behavioral health service delivery and 1590 could fill that gap. And then next one. So for this last sort of group, really we, we try to tie in what we've been hearing across the board from three other larger groups. So we did talk to folks with lived experience in relation to housing instability and homelessness the faith-based communities and culturally specific agencies. And what we've really heard loud and clear is that they're continuing to echo what we've been hearing across stakeholder groups. And we've listed these themes here. We're not gonna dive too specific into each of these things because you guys have heard these in the last study session and you'll continue to hear it during this study session. But some of the big major themes that we continue to hear are things like needing culturally specific and responsive services, enhancing employment services, the increased need for behavioral health services and so forth, and for affordable housing specifically as well. And here I will hand it over to Tony Esparza to walk us through the early funding opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Martinez, and thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council for the opportunity to speak with you this evening about what we know to be a possibly very exciting option that we're bringing for your consideration. Uh, tonight, staff is seeking direction from Council to initiate a request for proposals uh, to fund behavioral health services and housing-related services related to HB 1590 funds in the amount of $1.8 million for 2021, also including the staffing cost to administer that funding. The portion of the HB 1590 funds that we would be using falls under the funding parameters of RCW 82.14.530, in which it states that no more than 40% of the funding may spend, be spent on the operation, delivery, or evaluation of behavioral health treatment programs and services or housing related services. Um, as you've heard this evening, we continue to hear immediate, critical, high priority needs um, throughout the data that's been gathered from our stakeholders. And as we all know, these needs have only um, increased due to the pandemic. In addition, you have expressed to us, council has expressed to staff, a desire to use this revenue efficiently and quickly. And we are doing that hopefully um, through your direction this evening to issue an RFP. 
As staff continue to build the long-term funding processes for utilizing HB 1590 funds, we are recommending establishing a funding allocation of approximately 20% of the anticipated revenue for the year to fund these early identified opportunities, which again totals about $1.8 million. The funding would go to agencies and organizations to contract for behavioral health services and housing related services, which I'll detail more for you this evening. If you could go to the next slide, please. We are recommending the use of an RFP process for several reasons that I'd like to go over with you tonight. Um, one, this process will allow us to receive new applications from both our agencies that are currently funded, but also those agencies that may not currently be receiving funding from the city, including those agencies that may have developed in response to need during the pandemic. In addition, we'll be able to focus the RFP specifically on the feedback that we've heard in our outreach including the need for culturally specific and equitable programs and the various um, specific priori priority areas of need that we'll talk about tonight. Um, the priori priority areas that we have heard are behavioral health services, um, supportive services, and rental assistance, and I will go into more detail. In addition, um, issuing this RFP allows us to use a, a process that is already in place that works well and efficiently um, having the review of applications and the forming of recommendations go through our Human Services Commission and be brought back to Council. This funding allocation would span 2021 and 2022, um, but would be an interim step as the long-term infrastructure for this program is established. Next slide, please. Through our stakeholder conversations, which includes our um, discussions with community-based agencies, faith-based communities, affordable housing providers and operators, those with lived experience in relation to homelessness and staff expertise, uh, we have identified some priority areas for the services component of the HB 1590 funds. The priority areas identified are behavioral health services, supportive services, and rental assistance. And behavioral health services in particular includes mental health services and also substance abuse or substance use disorder treatment. Supportive services and rental assistance also fall under the housing related services bucket of this portion of the 1590 funds as they enhance an individual or family's overall housing stability. Next slide, please. So now I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of the priority areas. Behavioral health services are a priority as they promote mental health, resilience, and well being. They enhance um, housing stability as our uh, residents can receive the support or treatment necessary to remain stable in their housing. In addition, we can increase the provision of low cost or no cost mental health services and substance use disorder treatment in our community. Next slide, please. Within behavioral health services, we will be seeking applications for some specific things, including same day mental health and substance use disorder assessments and treatments, medically assisted treatment for substance use disorders, culturally responsive services for historically underserved populations, services co-located at facilities and or housing properties, and behavioral health therapeutic case management. And again, these priorities were established based on the data that's been gathered through the outreach into the community. Next slide, please. Moving on to supportive services. Um, supportive services are a priority as they help individuals and families obtain and maintain their housing. They address housing barriers that led to the housing instability in the first place or that may have led to homelessness in the first place. And they enhance overall housing stability for the long-term future. When we issue the RFP, we will also be seeking some specific applications relative to supportive services. And those include case management services that will help an individual or a family achieve housing stability or employment services, which could include a variety of things, um, including case management, um, helping an individual obtain or maintain employment, resume building, interview uh, workshops or skill building, assisting a resident in applying for jobs um, or other things related to um, building the effort for employment. And then our last area of the RFP will be in the area of rental assistance. And we will be seeking um, applications in two areas relative to rental assistance. That includes um, assistance for families that are in a home but in crisis, um, that may need rental assistance in order to prevent eviction, 
um, or move-in assistance for those transitioning from homelessness to housing, but who may be in need of uh, additional support for move-in costs. And now I'll go over the process that the RFP would go through. Um, again, just to recap, these funds fall under the 40% of the funding that may be spent on the operation, delivery, or evaluation of behavioral health treatment, programs and services, or housing related services. Uh, the recommended allocation um, is 1.8 million for these priority services and staffing costs. And that is approximately 20% of the currently anticipated revenue for 2021. This RFP would allow us to quickly provide funding to organizations that serve our residents by using the existing, existing human services funding process. Upon direction from council this evening, we would move quickly. The RFP would be issued the week of May 10th. Proposals would then be reviewed by the Human Services Commission in June and funding recommendations would be brought to council for consideration in July. The contracts for these services would be one-time funding for two years for 2021 and 2022 in order to align with the Human Services Commission's funding schedule relative to the Human Services Fund. The second year of funding for 2022 would be contingent on funding availability and also agency contract performance, which is also in line with our typical human services funding process. Thank you and I'll turn it back over to Director Cummins to discuss next steps. Thanks, Tony. Um, I think as we wrap up here and talk about um, moving forward, you know, I was struck uh, as Mrs. Sparza was just speaking there, the council has been taking up this work program for only about four or four and a half months at this point. And you all may recall when the council enacted its rights under 1590, there were a lot of questions about, do we have a need? Can we spend the money? Uh, how quickly can we put together a work program because we didn't have this type of program at the city and weren't staffed for it at the time. Um, and now here we are four and a half months later and, and with council concurrence, you'll be in a place to um, start making a, a significant um, um, increase you know, in service in the community. So um, we think this is a good way to go forward to allow us to get going on some of the human services components that are vitally important to keep people stable in housing. Uh, and then get on to talking about how to uh, fund the housing projects themselves. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. Our last slide is always the uh, direction needed from council. Again, the first part of the presentation tonight was information only to set up the next couple study sessions. So uh, the ask of council, uh, if you concur, is to give direction to initiate the RFP um, using the considerations that Mrs. Farza outlined for you all. So uh, any of us are happy to take any questions um, from the council. Okay, terrific, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I'm gonna start off with you and then um, council, I assume everybody has a question. So I will um, open my eyes and see your hands raised and I'll call on you each. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, Mac, Tony, Liesl, Stephanie, great presentation. And um, the first thing I just wanna applaud you on moving so quickly on this. And Mac, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Four and a half months since we took that vote and we already have a process in place for at least 1.8 million of this money coming through. That's a huge achievement and that's moving I would think, especially in the human services, very, very quickly. Um, so thank you so much, um, especially as um, I, I think as a council, we all had reiterated how quickly we wanted to move and have some quick wins. And I think there are some built into this RFP process. So I'm certainly in favor of this and to initiate these, this process to identify the behavioral health services and the housing related services funded by money from House Bill 1590. Um, I also really appreciate the, um, the real specifics built into this RFP process and the amount of work that you've done alongside with the uh, Human Services Commission in terms of outlining those very specific behavioral health services that are so critical in the community right now. Um, so, um, you know, real kudos all, all around. So with that, I'll just ask a couple of quick questions here. Um, 
In terms of, now we know uh, if an RFP is approved that the agency would outlay the, the money or the capital in order to provide these services and this would be on a reimbursement basis, but when they um, ask for that reimbursement based on their services, how quickly do we turn it around? You know, given that some of these agencies might be smaller in nature that would need to be very quick in order for them to continue operations at a level that they would like to see. So I don't know if Tony, you could uh, speak to that um, a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So um, upon direction from Council um, in July, when we come back from recommendations, the next step would simply be putting the contracts in place. Um, and then as you mentioned, um, we do provide our contracts on a funding reimbursement basis. So we receive requests for reimbursement on a quarterly basis. And our expert city staff across departments, um, FAM has really ramped up in response to the large amount of funding that the council has provided for human services during the pandemic and um, can quickly turn back around reimbursements. Terrific. And then my other question is just uh, based on the, um, the metrics that we'll be tracking in terms of what we want to see uh, from those agencies and the work that they're performing. And then also uh, that might set the path in terms of uh, engaging those same agencies again. I think some of them obviously will be agency we've worked with uh, many times in the past and we have a good working history with them and we know what to expect. Um, but what sorts of metrics are we going to track going forward with this once an RFP is approved as well? Mac, would you like me to go ahead and take that question also? Please, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So with each of our um, contracts and human services, and we would anticipate doing the same with our contracts relative to these funds, we ask for a number of reports from the agencies. On a quarterly basis, they need to report back to us on the service units provided in accordance with their contract. Um, they also need to annually report back to us on the outcomes that they have accomplished. Um, in addition, they report back to us on demographic information. So um, uh, metrics that we'll specifically be looking for are what kind of an impact are we making based on an increased number of service units in certain targeted areas. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, a number of the areas that we are seeking proposals for would be some new services in our region. And so that would be a very distinct metric to just be able to announce that we are now offering a service that was not prior um, offered in our area. And of course, as we um, go through the human services needs update process, yes. um, as our reports come back in on metrics on what demographics are served, and as we compare that with what need we find highlighted in the needs update, we'll be able to refine and continue to target to make sure we're serving the right populations. Terrific. Thanks so much, Tony. Absolutely. Council Member Stokes followed by Lee and Zahn. Okay, yeah. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. I'm, I'm really excited about this and I appreciate the Deputy Mayor's uh, asking some um, kind of uh, procedural questions which we need to, to know, you know, how the process is going and all. And uh, it just reinforces, I think, uh, how well planned uh, this effort is, and, and I, I'm really looking forward to the, to the process, to, to the progress. What I wanted to say also, I'm, I'm, it's very exciting, one, to, to get something done in a re reasonably short time period. Um, that's, that takes a lot of work, and um, that is very important in this particular area. I, um, I'm glad that um, the legislature looked a little more into how do we, how do we work with and how do we uh, help people who are uh, at the lower end of this. We're, we have a lot of great ideas, a lot of plans going on at the upper end of affordable housing. And uh, I think this effort is, is um, I'm very applaud the effort to uh, attack and work on uh, the, the very difficult problem we have with um, at the other end of, of the scale. So I'm glad we're focusing on that. And um, it's, it's a hard, hard thing, but if we don't deal with this segment of the population, all the other work we're doing in the other area is just gonna make a bigger hole in, in this, this particular part. And um, I also like going back, you're not, it's not part of the RFP, but I think the other thing I wanted to men mention is, again, very pleased that looking at the, the uh, houses at risk, we've talked about, uh, you know, we have an inventory to some extent of house, uh, uh, low cost housing that's out there that we can preserve. You know, we have the Highland Village example. Um, and I'm, I'm just glad to see us really going um, more kind of full bore on that as well, because that's 
you know, why, um, if we can preserve housing, uh, that's that's a cost less and is a lot better and than having to go out and build more new housing. So we're having a, really a full, I, I think a full plate of, uh, of um, ways to address this. And I'm, I'm very pleased with that. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm all in, uh, I think you're doing a great job in the RFP and let's get it out there and get moving on it. So uh, uh, this is, I'm just very excited about it and very pleased at, at the efforts and um, let's, uh, we just continue working together to, um, to show people that Bellevue can do this and do it well because the people that need it uh, deserve it. Thank you. Council Member Lee followed by Zahn and Robertson and Council Member Lee, I'm just gonna remind you to keep your comments to three minutes. And then I see Council Member Barksdale, you will go after Council Member Robertson. Do I start now? Yeah. Okay. I'm impressed with uh, how fast you got this very important piece of the affordable, well, affordable housing homeless <laughs> shelter program. You know, it's in the supportive services and uh, this is great. And also I'm very impressed how fast you got it going. And that's just to show you know, how fast you can do the work and do good work uh, if you know the right people. <laughs> anyway, good job. Uh, Mike, I have a couple of questions. One is 1.8 million, is it for two years or for each year? It is Answer. per year. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Director Cummings. Per year, okay. All right, so you already have commitment for two years, okay. Uh, my question concern is also the scope. Um, I, I think that this is uh, it's, it's good. I, I can't see too much of you know anything else you can do, but I'm just thinking that maybe uh, you know instead of limiting it, it may be that's all you need. But there might be other uh, additional you know things that you might want to consider, which I don't. We have we don't know all the specific detail, right? You're gonna make the IFP. So when you send out the IFP, are you gonna go to, uh, who are you going to? I like the thing you mentioned is underserved, under law communities. You're gonna build capacity. I always wanna remind you, Tony, you know what I'm talking about. You know, bridge the gap, build capacity, right? I think that's important. So I wanna know, uh, we should include uh, the non-traditional folks. Like, you know, didn't, I didn't see a few of them, like ACRS, you know? Uh, like people who are the indigenous Americans, that's important, very much so. And other Asian groups, you know, Vietnamese, Korean, Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, there's a lot of them, right? So I just want to be sure, you know, your scope does not limit, you know, actually should be expanded, okay? And I, what, what they are, you know, I trust you, that you, when you are sending out the RFP, that you know you are going to be inclusive, and if you don't have them, uh, please uh, make effort because I know you can do that <laughs> to find them. Okay, and I think we need to have a start beginning, and this is basically what my goal is, my interest is, and so again, when you know the right people, you can get it done very well, <laughs> and so I just want to be sure we, you know emphasize and don't ignore the easily forgotten, ignored, overlooked groups. Thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, did you want yeah, to answer? Did I go three minutes? No. How many minutes then? <laughs> did staff I was want just to, going to say, I was just going to say agreed. Yeah, Council I want to Kimberly. respond. Yes, absolutely agreed. We will be doing broad outreach when we issue the RFP and um, seeking applications from as many diverse, uh, whether they are currently funded or not, agencies as we can find. 100% agreed. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was going to ask you, how do you choose these, you know, entity, these, uh, these people? I'm not going to ask you how. I know you're going to figure out how to do it. Okay? If you don't, we're here to help you. Thanks. Well, the Human Services Commission has been doing that very successfully for years. So they're going to, I think, use them. Right. Um, Council Member Zahn. Human services does whatever they're given the scope to do. So this is okay, a new so scope. why don't you describe again how we use this Human Services Commission to make I understand. decisions? I understand. 
Sure, Go absolutely, ahead. Mayor. So um, the, the first primary effort will be the outreach for ensuring that um, various agencies in our community know that it's an opportunity to apply. And so that will be a primary means that we reach out to agencies that may be reaching populations that are currently underserved. Um, once those applications come back, um, staff to perform a review and then they go to the commission. The priorities um, that we have named um, specifically call out the need uh, for services that are culturally responsive to historically underserved communities. And so that is part of the direction that will be given to the commission in their review is to prioritize those applications along with the other priorities named this evening. Thank you. Council members on. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Tony, for all your work. I mean, I think acting with urgency, this is amazing. We're going to get going with this. I, I agree that this is the right focus of those three areas, especially co-location of being able to have the behavioral health services, as well as the substance use disorder. Um, I did have a couple of questions that you can answer later or now. Uh, one is, or, or comment, Beyond just McKinney-Bento, it seems like we might want to do more outreach to community connection centers and others in the Bellevue School District. I agree with Councilmember Lee about ACRS. Um, thank you for adding Be Glad. I noticed that that was added as part of supporting the LBGTQ community. So thank you for that. Um, I am curious about on the rental assistance, how this dovetails with the American Rescue Plan money that we're getting and how that might play into monies that are available. Um, and related to seniors aging in place that may be homebound, are we also looking at potentially some mobile ment mental health support or funding more within our CARES program? Um, and then um, when you talk about the 1.8 million, including staff costs, can you give me a sense for how much of the 1.8 will actually go out as grant funding versus staff time? And then lastly, uh, the question about the, the funding. So it's 1.8 this year, and the application will say, based on your performance, you're eligible for a follow-on of the um, additional funding in year number two. Is that right? I just wanted to confirm that. But anyway, I, I really love what we're doing. I just it just spurred some questions. Thanks. Um, I'm happy to answer some of those for you this evening, Council Members. On thank you for those questions. Um, relative to how does this dovetail with the American Rescue Plan? So um, decisions were made uh, for the priorities based on. Um, what we've heard from the data from the community, also knowing that we know right now the parameters of these dollars, and um, we do not yet have direction for the rescue plan dollars. So mm -hmm. as these applications come back and they are presented to the commission, um, a, a factor that the commission always considers if, is if there's new or emerging funding on the table that could meet some of the needs. And as you know, we always receive more applications than we have funding for, and that would be one of the ways that they may May be able to choose to prioritize it is if we have more direction on the rescue plan dollars at that time. We just do not right now. Um, the homebound seniors, I would absolutely agree that's a, a prime, uh, priority population that would need services. And so um, that would depend on if we received applications for those services. But I would definitely think it fits the criteria of um, underserved populations as mentioned in the potential RFP. Um, the two-year funding, um, the language that we're suggesting is the same that we use for all of our contracts for human services funding, which is that they are told in advance um, that our contracts are um, renewed for a second year determinant upon funding and contract performance. So we're not imposing something new, we're imposing the same process that we always mm -hmm. use in our contracts. And then to the um, staffing time, I would need to come back to you with that information, but perhaps one of the other great members of the team um, uh, may have more information for you at this point. Thank you. Council Member Robertson followed by Council Member Barksdale. Thanks. Well, I think this is a home run. Um, I really, really like how um, staff has set this up. Um, it's obvious that you guys have been listening to council because we talk a lot over the many years about 
What can we do to prevent homelessness to make sure that people, you know, it's, that's so much cheaper to keep people housed than to try to house them after they've lost their home. So I think that that's critical. I think the behavioral health is excellent. Um, that will help get to the root cause of both homelessness and poverty. So I'm very big supporter of that. And the rental assistance uh, and supportive system, uh, services are kind of combined in the helping prevent homelessness, helping keep people moving, because we want people who are here to, you know, live and succeed and thrive. So um, I'm two big thumbs up on this. Um, and I guess I would just make the comment, and I believe that we have it, um, I, I like that we um, that you said in answering Council Member Zahn's question, um, Tony, that the grants are renewable subject to funding and performance. I think making sure that we are tracking outcomes is going to because this is the first year of the start of this of this revenue source to really help the people of this city. And if we track outcomes and see what programs and which service providers have the best outcomes, that's gonna make sure that this money is used well, not just in year one, but in all the out years uh, to come. So I, I that measurements and the metrics and the following people, because I know that in a lot of human services, not necessarily in Bellevue, but the data that you get is not necessarily helpful in evaluating how effective a program is. So I hope that we will be very um, diligent working with our partners that we're funding in getting the right data so that we can analyze how effective these programs are. Do they keep people held, housed? Are, how are the people doing in the years following? Have they kept their apartments? Have they returned to sobriety and gotten jobs and housing and stability, et cetera, et cetera? To the extent that we can do that, I think it will make us that much more effective um, as we use the money going forward. So uh, I'm ready to vote yes, as soon as everyone's had their say. Uh, no questions for you, just some comments, thanks. Council member Barksdale. All right, thank you. Um, so really appreciate the work that you all have done, Tony, um, and I agree with the priorities that you've set out. My only question is around as we do the outreach to the smaller and less maybe uh, organizations that we haven't had a chance to work with in the past, um, will, could some of the administrative, some of the funds be in terms of administration be used for technical assistance, not just for the application, but also to help with evaluating performance? Thank you, Councilmember Barksdale. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding your um, question correctly, and I apologize. I seem to have something in my throat. Um, are you suggesting that the um, some of the staffing funds could be used for technical assistance? Yes. Um, so, um, absolutely. Um, if if additional staffing is needed, um, that also takes time to add. But throughout the process of the contracts, if we are able to increase staffing in response to what is needed, which we'll come back with that information to you all, then most certainly that would be built in in our estimation of the time necessary for staffing. Okay, cool. Yeah, just wanted to make sure in terms like when they apply as well as any help they might need for tracking um, performance as well, because if they're a smaller agency, they may need a little bit of help there. I understand. It may, and it may be a new process for them. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just, again, want to commend you for working so quickly on this. This was all new to us when we took this vote and uh, you were starting from zero and creating a program to disperse this money in a thoughtful and, and uh, you know, it's just gonna change lives so much. And I think change Bellevue as well for the better. So I'm, I'm just really thank you for all your hard work. Um, I am a huge proponent of same day services and all my work on the mental illness drug dependency advisory committee, my work on East Side Human Service Forum, my work on the Human Services Commission and as a, a degree in community services, I really believe in same day services. So I love the emphasis on that. Um, getting people the help they need when they need it. I have two questions. Um, I'd like to know if you can just kind of talk about how this kind of funding is going to help our current homeless population that we have, the people that we have living out on our sidewalks, um, in, our, in our public property, and the people in the shelters uh, um, in our community. And also, I just, I thought of this during your presentation, can we use this money 
to fund, if we choose to, a mental health professional for emergency services. I know we have the CARES program, it's great with MS um, social workers, but I'm really curious if we could hire, use this money to hire a mental health professional as well. So those are my two questions. Absolutely, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll start with your second question. Um, my response to that would be, I would need to consult and get more guidance from legal on if these funds can be redirected um, for internal programs, I'm unclear on that. So we will um, research that and get back to you. And again, unless one of the other team members has already done that research and wants to, to chime in, we have some other great people here as well. Um, but to your question around um, how this funding could potentially impact those in our community that are homeless or unhoused, um, uh, that's an excellent question. And so throughout these priorities, um, the hope is that this will both be impactful for those that are unstable in their housing and those that are unhoused right now. And so particular, as we look through the priorities, um, uh, specifics that are called out that will make a particular impact on our homeless population are, are the same day mental health um, and substance use disorder assessments and treatment and medically assisted treatment. While um, addiction is not a cause for every person that is homeless. It definitely is a contributing factor. And so that alone will have a significant impact. Um, in addition, the capacity for services to be co-located at facilities, um, that could potentially be at our shelters. Um, so that presents an opportunity for shelters to apply for funding um, to co-locate services there. And it increases the likelihood that someone that is unhoused will be able to access those services. Um, there's a couple of forms of case management listed here, um, both within the supportive services and the therapeutic services. And that too can help someone who's struggling to manage their daily details, have someone that can help kind of guide their overall process and access to help. And then within rental assistance in particular, um, two types of rental assistance were called out, one for those that are in crisis that are in housing, but also another form in particular for those that are unhoused or homeless um, move-in assistance. And so that could have a dramatic impact on an individual's ability to move from homelessness to housing. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me unpin you here so I can see everybody. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there you go. Well, that's great. I'm very excited. So we want to give some direction. I think I, I have see a consensus here from everybody. So Deputy Mayor, can you give us a motion, please? Certainly. I move to direct staff to initiate an RFP process to identify behavioral health services and housing related services to fund with HB 1590 funds. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Excellent. <clears throat> well, we look forward to having you come back and see what the next step is. Thank you, Mayor. We will be back in four to six weeks to continue the discussion around creating uh, the capital, the, uh, the creation of the actual affordable housing themselves. And you will see uh, after the RFP um, comes back that move forward to the Human Services Commission. Terrific. And that comes back in two weeks. Isn't that right on the timeline? Or was it one week? The RFP? Um, the RFP will be issued the week of May the 10th. I don't believe we will bring it back to council. We will take your direction this ah, evening and go ahead and issue that. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. That's the end of our meeting. So a meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Great discussions.